Three, two, one, go. Good evening, everybody. I am Mark Mendoza. The show is 22 Now, and the network is Area 22 Productions. Tonight, as I always say, but tonight, especially tonight, I have a very, very special guest on with me. Dwa. A little dwa in the background. Little, dwa. little tears because I said such a nice thing about him, which the rest of the show I'm not going to say nice things about. Count on that. Anyway, I have a very, very close friend of mine, very close friend of uh, Twisted Sisters, um, and a tremendous history in uh, the music industry and with Twisted Sister. Okay, I want everybody to welcome um, the very likable, the very lovable, the very cute, (laughs) Joe Gerber. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Listen, I, I, I'll tell you what. You know, when when I first started this show and we first discuss, started discussing about guests, and um, it went, went up and down the line, and of course, you know, the guys in TS are obvious targets, obvious. and you know, it'd be on the show, not targets. Well, it'd be on the show, but to have you on is a target. I'm honored. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, you should be honored. But um, the history, the stories, <laughs> the things that we can't say—the things that we can't say—yes, live on the air because a lot oh, yes. of it can still be used as I, evidence. Yeah, against I, th- us. I think statute of limitations on a couple things is still alive. Yeah, yes. oh, it must be, yes, and that's I like 35, so. 40 years later. Yes, well, certain things that never, you know, don't go away. Don't go away. Yeah, don't go away. <laughs> but um, so. what I did forget to do, if the uh, floor, you can help me for a second. My paperwork is over there. And I didn't put it over here, and it'd be great if someone could hand it to me. I need all all copies, all four pages. I frazzled you, huh? No, no, no. I was just thinking about doing this, and and I'm like, yeah, don't worry about it. You can just walk it over here, and and I'll grab it from you. Walking in. There's a lot of cool stuff on here. Um, as I was wow. saying before, the stories are endless. Yes. The the uh, the things that went on, the comedy, um, and of course, the business end. Uh, a lot of that. I don't think there was someone more cutthroat in the business than you. I am now. I'm very complimented. Well, I'm just saying. I'm, well, it's it's not going to last long. Okay. It's just not going to last. Give long. me a big head, then you're going to yeah, just right, then I'm gonna oh, deflate gotcha. it. Gotcha. But um, yeah, the, your your tremendous history with 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 Twisted Sister is we couldn't cover it in an hour. We no, really couldn't. No, with all the stories and everything, so which means we may take this up at a later date. I'm available. Uh, if we have a lot of things left. Uh, yes, I know. <laughs> not doing much else. <laughs> Listen, you kidding? I've been prepping for this. How many years? I know. How many, many years? Many years. Many years. Especially since I asked you only a few days ago. <laughs> but I knew you would. Um, as And I want to get back to the history is extensive. Um, before Twisted Sister, First of all, I wanna, how long have you lived where you're living? Where I'm living now? I'm, I moved into my apartment in March of 1976. 76? Yes, the end of March 76. Yes, I, wow. yes. so I've been living there, um, what, 50, uh, 43 years. 43 years. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's yes. amazing. Yeah, it's um, really dirty by now. Really. <laughs> it's a, really well, well, we're going to go over that <laughs> in a little bit, okay? Really and I, you might know where I'm going to go with that. Oh, are you really going to go there? Oh, gonna I didn't there. think you were going to go yeah, there. Yeah, we're going to okay. go there, all right? That's a little wow. bit later on as we get wow. to this. Wow. In my outline of things to pin you against the wall. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I didn't realize this was a roast. Okay. I, yes. Inquiring minds want <laughs> yes. to know. Yes. Okay. So you're Joe Pining me today. Yeah, I got you. Absolutely. There's a reference for you, old timers. Okay. You know, you had a, a huge reputation of selling hi-fi gear before you were working with in, in, in rock and roll and, and true. things like that. You know, you were called Joe Atlantis. Joe Atlantis. I was named after my store. Yeah, yes. Joe Atlantis. Joe Plus, I didn't want to use my real name given who I was dealing with in your world. <laughs> That's not <laughs> a joke, a folks. But you definitely, Some of those you people. were legendary, whether good or bad, you were still legendary in that world. Yes. Uh, selling, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, up, uh, upscale hi fi audio right? equipment. Just to let you know, if anybody's into any of this stuff and understands <laughs> it, Joe was one of the first guys that I, the first guy that I know that took how many automotive 12 volt batteries? Oh, I, I had, I had, um, for a pure power supply? I used eight. Uh, eight 12 volt auto batteries for power supply for my amplifiers. Right, so because you don't you so don't want any of that no, mess coming from the wall. Right, you don't want any dirtiness coming from the wall. DC, pure, pure DC, pure DC. Yeah. Yes, auto batteries, a whole yep. rack of them. And external batteries. capacitors, right. the size of garbage cans. Right, so which 
not only gave me a lot of headroom, right. but served as a burger alarm. If anybody tried to take T it, they would have had to cut the wires, and they would have, they would have just been yeah, you smoldering shoes them. on the but floor. But these day, this day and age, with all the guys with these big cost areas, one of these big capacities. Oh yeah, yours were easily. I don't. They look like oil bins. They were. They were. They, they were. They were five gallon like drums. A, yeah. Yeah, they were five gallon drums. That's yeah. how big they were. So yes, and you could have definitely all that to make sure that uh, the first Ramones album sounded perfectly pristine. More coming, than that, coming the first Dictators. First album. Dictator. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, we had it. We had still it. my you favorite had, record. I, I understood that you had your own turntable that was just for Go well, Girl Crazy. I had it at my own tone arm with a cartridge because it was EQ'd so strangely that I, you know, you couldn't play it on it. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, you once. Heard I, I remember I had, I had remastered it sort of yes. and compressed the hell up, yes. and you had heard it on on my car stereo. And you're like, right. this almost this almost sounds good. Who well, is this? Sounds acceptable. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Dictators. It, the detatas. The detatas. The detatas. <laughs> anyway, so um, I don't remember everything in in chronological order, but. You did see the dictators. You were a big fan. Oh yeah, I was a big fan. And, and, and um, I, Early you 70s. told me that you had been many times. You had been to CBGBs to see the dictators. Yeah, and a lot. And of also Club eighty two. Club eighty two, which is the first and, time I saw you. Right, was Club eighty two. Was at Club eighty two. Yeah, that was uh, in the fall of seventy. 70, no, seventy. Five. Was it that early? Yeah, it was that oh, early. Yeah, okay. so oh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, yeah. 75. 75. Yeah. So that's when we played all those places yeah. together and did all that stuff. So, yeah. Um, the, so I remember the first time I met you was before I was in Twisted Sister. Yeah. And I remember, I think it was at Speaks, was it? It was at Speaks. Speaks. And it was at Speaks. I'll, I'll JJ you. French brings me back to the dressing room, introduces me to D and Eddie and, and, and Tony um, and Kenny. And when he goes to you, uh, you know, it's just Mark Mendoza from The Dictators. Joe goes, I know. I know. It's a very funny story. I was, I was, I, I had through a, real, a weird series of events. I was a bartender at a bar called the Mad Hatter in um, East Quag in the summer of 73. And the original Twisted, of which only JJ remained. Right, of course. They were the house band there that summer, and I was a bartender. So I got to know them pretty well, and they were friends. And then when he formed the new band, I guess it was early 75 or late 74, um, as people would start to come in, they'd have audio needs. He'd bring them to his buddy, who was now in the music, you know, in the audio business. And I became like I was like the twisted uh, equipment guy. Um, but I also I was a punk, and I was into the city stuff, and I was too cool for school, and you know all this all this suburban you know metal stuff. I was way too cool for that, and used to really bug the band because n I, I never got excited about anything. And then I'm in the dressing room at Speaks, and he walks in. And just blows me up completely. Because I knew him. He's, this is the bass player of the Dictators. This is the greatest band that, since sliced bread, as far as I'm concerned. And this is the bass player. What is he doing? Oh, my God. And I turned it to Fanboy. It's one of maybe twice in my life I turned it to Fanboy. It was that night. And what was the other one? Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Right. That which we'll get to also, which was an amazing story. Yeah. So you said sliced bread. Was sliced bread the band before bread? <laughs> Funny you should ask, because people do ask me, because of my age, I am asked often, what was it like before sliced bread? <laughs> <laughs> to which I just you must have been something give them before, a, a, a kneeing in a private area and we move on. Move your hand off the microphone. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> you should know better. Oh, yes, Steve, is that better, Stephen? There we go. Thumbs I up. I can't see him. Well, he, you know, you don't have to worry about it. I'll take, I do okay. everything with him. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. I'll take. Don't, don't you worry. Don't worry about little, nothing. Don't worry your pretty little head, control. Joe. Right, I got Joe. this. So let's get back to the story here. So, uh, well, that was it. I walked in. I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know. I, I, know I saw who you he look is. at me going like. It. I lost it, man. Yeah, you that's the only time I talk. And I can tell you that D and J, that was the happiest day of their lives because they were just sick of me and my attitude, and because they needed me, so they couldn't just blow me up in front of the crowd the way they were normally with somebody who was acting too cool. They yeah. had to be nice to me, but they love the fact that you blew me up. Just took it. I didn't have Just to say anything. Sigh right through, right through the lungs. All the air went out. I was like, oh, That's, it's, it's, it's marked funny. by bad, by bad <laughs> Yeah, I know who he is. They were, very they were very happy. Very, very funny. Yes, uh, and, I, and I never regained the same level of cool again. <laughs> I, I, I beg to differ. Some, you I beg to differ. Nah, I think, I think, I think, you actually, I think you've actually regained it. And oh. Because I've watched you do some business and get things on. Well, I'm, I can do that. We uh, we, we um, have gone through a lot together. We have traveled the world together, Several the country, times, yes. the club scene. 
what people don't understand in the music business, and there are some people, there is a handful of people compared to everybody, the amount of people in the music business, is what an incredible club scene we've had um, back then in, in, in the, uh, right through the 70s into the early 80s, oh, yes. when you could play within, I guess, a 100 mile radius in New York City and not hit the same place for four or five, maybe we were six on a weeks. Two and a half, we were on a 10 week rotation. Right, 10 week rotation. I would book 10 weeks at a time, and we had markets segmented. Every, depending on, on where you were, every 10 to 20 miles was a whole other market. Mm -hmm. And you were constantly trying to expand to, to reach new markets. So, I don't know if you remember, when we finally got the record deal, we had just gotten to the Delaware Water Gap. Right, right. And we were sitting there thinking, About how ready long? ready to cross the state line. Right, and we were sitting there thinking, how long at this rate it was going to take us to get to California, and it was not a pleasant thought. No, no, you're talking about 40 um, years. But we'd move, every 10 weeks we'd add, we'd move a little further east, well, not east because we were already in the Hamptons, but we'd move a little further west, a little, a little further, further south. North, we ended up just north of Philly. Right. We ended up well, but near Albany right. at the very end, very Not close far, to Albany, all the way into Connecticut. Yeah, way, yeah. So the, almost the, the Massachusetts line. The, and and it was. Um, listen, I can only speak for myself in the band. I know other people had complaints about it, but it it was. I enjoyed it. It was a grind. It was like oh, a was regular a job because we spent many hours a day traveling, doing sound checks, oh. playing shows, and if we were on the road, sometimes we stayed in. Let local, me for for anybody that's not in a local flea bed yeah, hotel. For anybody that's not familiar with the kind of work that these guys did. Let me just give you an idea of what it was like. There was this, this, this it was predominantly a cover band circuit uh, that Twisted was good enough to actually get to start playing originals in. But even then, about 50% Cover material, of, yeah, yeah, and there were all these clubs throughout the Northeast. It didn't really exist in the rest of the world, and it only listed existed for a very short period of time there. But there was a tremendous amount of business to be done. Um, but Twisted, the goal was always to be the biggest band in every market, uh, and that required a lot of work. That meant other bands would show up at nine o'clock, set up, and start their first set at ten. We show our crew was there at three o'clock in the afternoon. The band was there at seven for a sound check. Club would open at nine, and then we'd sit in the dressing room for two, three hours sometimes before the first set of two or three, or in the early days, four. Um, but five days a week, and then you drive. A lot of times it was a good where where you were out on the island with D. It was later on, well, originally with JJ, and then later on with D. So you had a two-hour drive from just about everywhere other than the island. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah when it was I was long. in the city. Each way. Yeah, each way exactly. Each way. So you'd be up essentially. What your day was, you'd wake up at. Noon, you had an hour to get together. Um, if you if you were doing crew stuff the way I was, sometimes you'd have to leave at one. Otherwise, you leave about four or five to pick Sit everybody in up. Tons of traffic. Sitting tons of traffic yeah. on the way out. Got to get to the club at seven. Two hour sound check. Then um, usually we have some support act if we were lucky. Otherwise, we'd have to do three or four sets. Finish it up by the time you're wrapped up and ready to go. It's five in the morning. You drive two hours home. You're getting in bed at seven in the morning. Waking up at once, starting the whole thing over again, five days a week, sometimes five, six. Sometimes six days. It was a special days. event. Yes. Uh, the amount of work that these guys had to put into it, uh, and the amount of physical energy required, the way they performed. If anybody, anybody has ever seen the band live, um, they know how energetic they are. It compared to those club shows was nothing. They were putting even more into it because. It was it was just an obsession to try and get somewhere to try and get out of these darn clubs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was that was definitely because they were always, dumps. They yeah. were these were most of them were dumps. Most of them were dumps. Yeah, most of them were dumps. Even the big ones, when you get right down to it, very few of them weren't dumps. The yeah, but there was some. There was a couple. Of there nice was a ones, couple of nice know? ones. I mean, but. how could you how could you not? I mean, probably <laughs> the cleanest club ever in the world was the Vaginal Exam. Vaginal. Oh, that was a beautiful club. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was the other thing is the guys would come up with. There was a club called Circus Circus, which we only refer to. Was Jerkus Jerkus. Right. The final exam became the gynecological clinic known as the vaginal, the vaginal exam. exam. Uh, yeah, yes. Because which which is funny because it was the best kept club in the circuit. The cleanest club. And the, the owner, who was a yeah. hysterical man, Bobby yeah. Troy and Alva Sholem, just passed God recently. Rest, yeah, God he rest his um soul. We miss him. Yeah, I miss him too. Yeah, but he, was he would take guy. it personally because you did most of the club owners understood making fun of the club, A was part of the show they were doing, B was kind of defensible given that most of these clubs deserve to be made fun of. Right. Uh, and the club was packed, so what did they care? <laughs> Bobby took it personally, and he would shout shout back at the but band you, from the you, stage. But you, he was still a very funny guy. Very funny he, guy. I, I, it, it, if, if people, if you if, saw... If he had talent, Netflix, he was funny enough to be in the band. Well, absolutely. Yeah. But if you saw the, the, the Twisted Netflix movie, 
Uh, we are twisted. We are twisted. Sister, yes. Bleeping sister. Bobby Jordan is uh, interviewed in that. Yes, and just and a he. I think he, some of the extras he's got more into. Right, and he also, um, he's the guy who looks like and sounds like he could be in The Sopranos. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, without a doubt. Or, or another study for Frankie Valley. Right, another study for in uh, Jersey Boys. Right, right. Yes. Frankie Ada Valley. Yes. Right. Speaking of Sopranos, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there's two kinds of club owners. Essentially, yes. That only okay, goes. This is it. One is, who owns a bar? Alcoholics, because it just saves them time and money. Right, right. So there was a the subsection of owners that were alcoholics, but they usually didn't own the big rooms. Big rooms were owned by gentlemen who were they they they, they, they knew people and um, they had connections. They had connections, and uh, <laughs> what's really interesting is if you think about it. If you're running a business where uh, you're taking in large amounts of money and you're not, uh, there's no way to justify it for tax purposes. Well, then here's here's this big catering hall that you own, and here's this band that can put 5,000 people in there on a night. Well, it would be useful to have them come in and bring those 5,000 people in because then all of a sudden, our crowds never drink that much, but on a night like that, they'd be ringing twenty, thirty dollars a head, you know, to move money, and it's it's a form of, I won't use the term, but uh, it was very useful. But be careful what you say; you may get us in trouble with the good guys and bad guys. <laughs> this, I know, the statute of limitations. Oh, okay. <laughs> However, what was really interesting about it was getting to know on a first-person basis because the band was so good and had built up such a big following that I became a very important person to these people because I could be responsible for giving them an extra date every month or two. Right. Uh, and they knew it, so they were really, really nice to me. You have no idea how safe you feel if you live in New York, if you know that at least one guy from each of the five families is looking out for you oh, at any given doubt. moment. And, and they, they looked out for the whole man. Oh, absolutely. They, they, they loved absolutely. us. You know, absolutely. But they always loved you. It, it, well, it was interesting <laughs> being around uh, that. Not that we really socialized with anybody at all, but they looked out for our best interest oh, and we didn't know it sometimes you know it makes sure these guys nobody messes oh, with these oh, guys oh yeah no or, the word was or, out yo without, without which was useful out. because sometimes some of the guys would say things off the stage that were maybe not the nicest yeah, thing yeah. in the world or perhaps you know Mark and I were single so perhaps we might meet you know some temporary companionship and it turns out that maybe her dad was we like we needed some yeah. instant sincerity we, you know, there was, yes, we, <laughs> yes we needed somebody to say that's okay it's alright you, you're alright right. you're alright Right. Yeah, you're not going to lose any body parts. Yeah, right. yeah, you're not going to lose any body parts. Absolutely. But the, the, the whole club scene was great. I mean, what an experience when you think of, you know, at the bands when we finally did make it and our peer bands like Poison or Motley Crue uh -huh. um, or, or any any one of those bands that, that came up to the same thing is the fact that we already had, including the early years of the original band with JJ in it, um, a 10 year Ten, history. Yeah. Before we got signed, well, that's, nobody had that. Nobody has it. Nobody had I don't that. think there is a band, a performer today, that can draw on the amount of experience that's, that some of the artists back then had by necessity. And there's the Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell, yeah, Gladwell. Toy Boat Gladwell principle of you do something 10,000 10, times, times, you get really good You're at it. You're an expert at it. These guys have played more than 10,000 shows. Oh, what they, a doubt. People would marvel especially when we first got a record deal and we started touring to places we'd never been before and promoters and record company people and fans would be like, how did you get this good? How do we not know about you? You know, it's very simple. It's something, it's not hard to play an arena. You no, know? those were easy when we got to shows. When that, we, especially when we opened up and you're playing a 30 minute or 40 minute oh, set. Oh yeah, as, as a like, support act, that's, even that's, nobody break cracks a sweat, a sweat don't crack a no, sweat. No. The hard ones are, uh, the promoter screwed the advertising up, yeah. and you're playing a bar on a Tuesday night on the Jersey Shore in February, and there's 12 people in the crowd. Yeah, that's a hard show to play. Yeah, that's you know, and and that's also a hard show to get paid times. from too. But exactly. that's a whole other yeah, story. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a whole other story <laughs> and something like that. But the, when you when you think of it, um, and it goes back, and I you know between doing the interviews about it, and 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 of course uh, uh, the movie that Andy Horn you know uh, directed for us, that so we are twisted like and sister. Told and a lot it about makes it. you think about those days and it makes you um, go back and like it or not appreciate what we had because there was 
Probably, yeah, I think you'll agree with me. There was probably three bands at the top. There was Twisted. Yeah, it Zebra. depends on the market. In, in right. Jersey, Crystal Ship was up there. Right. Long Island Zebra was up there. Yeah. Rat Race was was very big. In, so it was the Good Rats. And the good well the good the Good Rats were almost another level because yeah. their crowd was older, so they could charge like seven dollars or eight dollars a head. Back so then, they didn't sure. have to draw as many people. Exactly. And they could go. As, they had already they had done what we had done for an extra five years, so they were already out to Syracuse. I, I, you know, we're going to get funny here, and things are going yeah, to get really crazy. Yeah, it's really not funny so far. But I'd like to do a quick shout out to a guy who. Was who had a big part of us then? That was Kevin Brenner. Oh, absolutely! What a great! I mean, God rest his soul. He's been a long, absolutely. he's been gone a long time, but he was instrumental in the club days of, of helping us book these clubs and 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 putting us where we were in the club days. Yeah. And those club days is what pushed us, catapulted us out of it, believe it or not, into something else because of the reputation we had and of delivering. But he also the band, had, he had a lot to do with just yeah. I mean, so much of it. The, right. The radio strategy started right, with right. him, um, and also also JJ French. Oh, JJ was yeah, yeah. JJ I mean, French was f- instrumental in keeping us and making us a huge business. I did view. a part of JJ's job when right, I came in. Right, that's how much JJ he French did. was. Yeah. You know, running the band and and booking the band and thinking of all our strategies and things like that. And we can't we can't go away uh, without mentioning. Especially for the club days, JJ club, French absolutely. and Kevin Brenner. They they made it happen. They set the boil point. I came in essentially because JJ just couldn't do it anymore yeah, and it was play. A lot of work. So I picked up half of his job. He still had to do the other half on stage. Right. Uh, and it was it was a lot of work. And Kevin Kevin was a genius. Kevin was as smart a man as anybody I've ever met in my yeah, life. Yeah, Kevin, a great, a great guy, would have, big a great help him. to our careers, without a doubt. And um, and never wanted anything for him. We offered to try and drag him with us when we started to make it, and he was like, no, I'm, I'm okay. So when, at the end of the night, uh, Joe would settle our accounts <laughs> yes. with people. And it was great because a guy like Bobby Jordan would say to us in the dressing room, he would say, when he first met <laughs> Joe Gerber, he would say to us, are you really going to send that green kid in <laughs> to, to settle with us? The green. You had a green tint about you. I had a, I, well, I didn't, I spent, I, I calculated it once. I spent four and a half years without ever seeing the sun. So after a while, you don't, you don't turn white. You, you develop like a, a, a greenish cast Hue. to it's you. It's like having your color TV yes. not adjusted. Yes. Or one of the, the red gun or the blue gun is not working. And I had the green shoes. I had a lot of green, I had a lot of Kelly green. green shoes and clothes, which I would wear to accentuate the green. Well, we have to go back about the clothing and the shoes. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. You're not going to let Joe, me off on Joe that. single-handedly made a shoe called a corky famous because no one else in the band would go near the stuff. No, no. But and Joe would walk in with his look <laughs> to settle at the end of the night with these tough guy club owners, and they could until they got to know him. There's a reason. That. I will tell you what that was about. Oh, though. that was. Ne- this is never, see, be- never see, before revealed. To see Bobby Jordan's look when he'd see you walk in the office. Was there was a precious. reason for that, though. That was, was that was deliberate. Yeah, of course, but it was precious. I was replacing, as I said, JJ. Yeah. JJ's in the band. JJ is the most personable man in the world. Everybody loves JJ. Yeah. And me, not so much, for starters. <laughs> so now, here's this guy who's nowhere near as entertaining or likable or enjoyable that nobody knows, that isn't in the band. And now, the club owners, they're not getting their first person contact with the right. band anymore. They're getting an employee. They're getting the, the an band. employee, essentially. Right. Who, who, is this, who is this dude? And mind right? you, I would go to watch this because right. it would be fun to see their expressions the and horrifying. realize it, that they didn't really want to deal with right. them. Nobody, with and JJ I am also, I am also, I'm trying to do a good job. And I am, as he said, I am. I pride myself on extracting every last penny from my clients, and I'm being tough in ways that JJ never was. And I'm like, I'm calling him on things that JJ. He wouldn't necessarily let him slide completely, but he had a nicer way of getting around to it. Right. Or he might, every other time we were in the room, he'd keep a, a running mental count so he wouldn't have to constantly be on him. But I don't know this. I've been handed a bag of receipts and told good luck. That was my instruction from JJ to start the gig. So I'm feeling my way around. So I'm, I realized right away, these guys don't really want to deal with me. So I figured I'll make it really uncomfortable. It was a very homophobic time. So I painted my nails. I painted my toenails. His toenails. I wore... I wore Corkies. Were, were open tone water buffalo sandals, yes. like Roman sandals. Called corkies. Platforms. Yes. Two and a half inch platforms. 
Uh, no, just natural. They were they were cork colored with the. the I did have a. I did. Color. I did have a pair of blue suede that were crossed, but I didn't wear them. Those were my. Those those are my dress corkies. No, those, okay? That's what he. That's what. That's he for the to, weddings. That's, those are yeah, the weddings. That's for the wedding. weddings. and funerals. You know, when he was going to weddings and funerals. But um, that's what he wore. Or in the winter time, a lot of times. In the winter time, a lot of times I would wear uh, um, mukluks. You know, for everybody know what a muck luck is. Ski boots. You know what a muck luck is. No, take no, foot, say take no. big foot, kneecap them. Whatever's left on the bottom, that's a muck luck. Hollow the hollow them out. out that's a muck luck. Put your foot in there. Okay, that's what it, look, it looked like big foot. Oh, yeah. So the idea was to distract these guys and get the money before they realized what just happened. <laughs> and some of them you just had to drink with. That was always fun. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and and going back after you walk out of the <laughs> office and I would be sitting there or walk in to see them because I knew them well. They all felt like they'd just been brutally abused. First time through, it was, not, it was not fun. Sexually. I got a lot of complaints. And they go, I just don't feel right after this conversation I got, I had, with Joe being in there. There was more than one phone call I got from Kevin Brenner, and, and sometimes even JJ would be on the phone. But you got it. There's got to be another way to approach this, you know? You got And I kept saying, you know what? I'm making pri <coughs> the first time. I, the second time I I got in with Phil Basile, oh, who was oh. in many ways. Well, we'll go in, in, a, in a minute. We'll discuss with who. Second Phil time Basile I got in with Phil, I actually started to feel realize. Yeah, he's starting to get it. <laughs> he starts. He's, he's starting to realize the position I'm in and what I'm trying to do, and respecting the fact that I'm not really backing down in spite of who he is. And he was a pretty intimidating dude. Phil, without a doubt, he was the real deal. He was the real deal. The real deal. Who he owns speaks, but. It was it was great to see their expressions <laughs> and what they had to say after for you. Done. Maybe well, you got to realize that Joe was a cutthroat New York City hi-fi salesman. I was a I was a, a high pressure salesman. High pressure sales, without a doubt, high pressure. Yep. And then you used I that. A, I was the closer to go settle in every situation I've ever been in. It was it was interesting to yes. see how he. he there no do. very little finesse. Joe walked in and did his dance. <laughs> And left nobody happy. Interestingly enough, though, by the time we stopped playing clubs, there was so much finesse to that. But it but it takes time to develop. And then you uh, you had the club owners like um, what was his name Garvey? Right? Oh, well, Bob Garvey. Bob oh. Garvey, where where they had to do shots and drinks. You don't get, get paid. Yeah. You don't get paid until, until you, you drink you with the guy. Party with the guy. And I never drank. I didn't do anything. But I watched <laughs> Joe and JJ. There was one looped. night. I, I could handle alcohol, but there was one night, Garvey would go through a fifth of scotch in the course of a night. And one night, I got about halfway with him, and I realized I'm not getting any money, so I called JJ in, because JJ could handle a couple, and he did a couple. thing that anyone has ever seen and I don't even think I could tell it the same way again twice. It came out so perfectly I'm just so glad y'all could hear it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know where we go from here. Yeah, you know, oh, that's, yeah that's, it's the it's end of the It's all downhill from here. Yeah, we should just now. wrap it now. Yeah, we should just wrap it up. It doesn't get any better. I mean, night. even I laughed and I know say, the say punchline. Say goodnight to everybody. That's, that's, it, that's yeah. how it should be right now. But uh, let's go back to a couple of things. You know, uh, really Real quickly, and then we're going to move on to the funny stuff. Uh -huh. um, you know, people do, when we're when we're discussing the club owners, some yes. of them that had the connections. Yes. Um, when you mentioned Phil Bazile, who <laughs> was was decently close, and his son Frankie, yes, and Frankie, who's decently both close of whom are now in real estate. <laughs> yeah, in real yes. estate, yes. six foot under in real yes, estate. In real estate. Um, not they, making fun say, of them at all. Because, no, no, no. Uh, but that's we got that's, along with them very oh, well. Oh, famously. But uh, except when you guys realize didn't that was the actual Goodfellas. Yeah, the the, the phone they, call. They were the good fellows. When yeah. De Niro is in the phone booth making the phone making call, the call and he finds out that Pesci is not around anymore, the guy, the real life guy that was on the receiving end of that phone call was the guy that we used to do business with on a regular basis. He would out These were serious men. He they were very about, serious men. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what I can say or what I can't <laughs> say about that. But uh, you would walk in when it was amazing when, we, when the movie Goodfellas came out and you actually realized because we knew them we during knew that time people, yeah. and you realize that 
Oh, that's <laughs> that's we you that's, know. That's, that's Tony. Uncle that, Ralphie. That's Uncle Ralphie, that's, uh, right? Oh man, that's Phil. Yeah. That's Frankie. Yeah, that's Tony. So yes, yeah, they were what the movie was made of. Yeah. you know, made about yeah. was the, the good. Henry films. had been around too. Henry Hill. Henry Hill met him many times. No one near as good looking in real life. <laughs> no, no, no. That was, uh, that was a great that. movie. Anyway, you know, uh, it, since we decided to have you on a few days ago, you and I have been going back with emails, back and forth about emails about things and stories. That we want to discuss and the funny stuff, and some uh, some of the inner workings of a rock band back uh -huh. then, Twisted Sister, um, the the comedy that went on, the craziness that went on. I have to say, uh, and Joe Gerber included, that you're talking about six of the funniest guys was, on the planet. It was the chemistry was remarkable between us. It really was. You had five guys in the band. You had Joe Gerber. Okay, and the chemistry for in. comedy. Was just insane. There was, there, there was, there was, it was brilliant. AJ and Eddie. Uh, oh, and Eddie, just, Eddie's a ge comedic genius. Genius, he really genius. is. Nobody would know that, but he he could deadpan you better but than Eddie. He than, was the was only guy of everybody in that room. He was the only guy that when he landed <clears throat> something hard, everybody fell out. Nobody yeah, could follow. Oh, it was, no it matter was how great. good you something you was that you you put out there, somebody was always following right Didn't behind. Know. But when, when Eddie nailed one, that that was it. Everybody was out on the floor. The only thing about Eddie is, unlike, and I'm pointing at a good friend here, Nigel, um, who is a stand-up comedian and oh. a very funny guy. The only thing that, about Eddie is he didn't know how to flip the switch on and off. Yeah. Wow. Like, so he could have been, and still could be, an amazing stand-up comedian. Oh, amazing. Just doesn't, I don't think he knows how to flip it on and off, no matter what kind of day you had, yeah. you know, so, uh, but I'm telling you, you would cry listening to him. And, and, cry, and everybody cry. knows how funny D and JJ are. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Mark, yeah, obviously. Yeah. And AJ had this little buddy vibe going that really worked, you know. Before AJ, it was pretty much, the drummer was there just sort of absorbed the abuse, you yeah, know. Yeah, But AJ could give as good as AJ he AJ was very funny. Very funny. Yeah, very, but, very um, funny. One of the interesting things about Twisted was, that's the first band I ever worked with. I thought every band was like no, that. No, I had no idea. Not. I went out, I, I ended up having a fairly long, reasonably successful career in the music business. Yeah. I worked with a lot of bands. I worked with a lot of rap acts. Yeah. Uh, I've worked on film sets. I've done some production. I've done a lot of things in the entertainment business. I have never, ever, ever seen a collective of people together. Usually, if, if you got one guy as funny as anybody in Twisted in a band, it's considered a hysterical band. There was nothing like that, no, it ever. Was it was you, you And plus, talk. it was like a locker room. Yeah, oh yeah, it was definitely a locker room. There's no it two was ways about it. it. was absolutely, it was an abuse locker room. <laughs> Joe, so, going back and forth, and I always talk with my guests before I have them on, always. And sometimes I know a week or two in advance when they're right. coming on. We didn't have much I like Joe about three or four days before he was here. And the emails and lists <laughs> are endless about what we can talk about and what goes on in things. So, um, you know, just to get to some of this stuff, um, and I'm going to run down part of it real quickly. I know where I know where, I know what I'd like to start on actually. W which one do you want to start? I want to do a recent one actually. I want to do the one from when we were in Sweden in 2012. Oh yeah, the uh, the, the crystal cock and balls. The crystal phalluses, I like right, to call the it. Yes. Crystal phalluses. <laughs> Were twisted. This twisted has broken up in the in the mid '80s. To get back together again to do a benefit after 9/11. Discover there's a market that nobody realized was out there. It end up by by the early 2000s, they're headlining all the major festivals in Europe, um, bigger than the band had ever been in its heyday. Uh, partly because that's sort of the way of the world, and probably because ain't no act in their right mind is going to go on after them. So they'd start in the yeah. middle of the bill and everybody say, oh, we got a plane to catch, would you mind going on after? And they'd work them, pretty soon they were headlining everywhere. We go over, we're in Sweden, it was late in the year, it was the second time in Sweden, there was a little festival that was done in, a, in the southeast corner of Sweden that, um, it was mostly local acts except for Twisted, I think they had one special guest thing. It turns out the area in Sweden we were playing was known as the glass blowing capital of Sweden, which was funny because I didn't even know Sweden was known for glass blowing. But um, did, did we? Yeah. At the end of the it's show, the promoter story. comes to the dressing room, and I'm standing outside the dressing room, and he's got a box, and he says, uh, I, I, he, I, he pays me. Uh, I was functioning, I guess, as the touring business manager at that point. He pays me and says, he'd like to meet the band to present the band with a gift that they've prepared especially for them. Sure, 
sure. Bring him in the dressing room, opens it up, and there is a crystal phallus, hand blown, such as it is, if there is such a thing. Um, it's about that big. It, it is uh, anatomically correct. It is circumcised, so clearly they're not worried about the Nazis coming back anytime soon. And, and it is millennially correct in that there's no pubic hair on it, which I don't know how you would do that if you're trying to present. And anyway, but it is spectacularly beautiful and ridiculous at the same time. And on one side, they have etched in the glass the name of the festival, which is Skrangsjet or whatever. Yeah. And on the other side, they have etched Twisted's logo. Twisted's just, twisted's so he twisted's takes twisted's it out and proudly presents it to the band, and the band is the band's like ooing and eyeing and kind of backing up, you know, like, what? This is weird. Who's going to be the first to right, touch that? Right, right. So he puts it down, and I thank him profusely, and I say, you know, the guys, they really need a little time because it's right after the show. We don't usually don't let guests in right after the show. He says, okay, get him out of there. And I say, okay, who's taking this with him? And everybody's like, I ain't taking it. I, so I decide, you know what? I'll take it. Get back to the hotel. And Delta had lost our luggage on the way over. Yeah. Yes. Um, and as I'm packing that night, I realize there's no way this is going to survive Delta baggage carriers. So I think, what am I going to do with it? I, I don't want to just. I know. I always, you know, tip the, the the maids in the hotel. I'll leave it as part of the maids' tip. You know. That's a hell of a tip. Uh, yes. It's, so it's this unique ob, obje, yeah, right. object dart, right? Um, so now the next morning, I'm, I'm downstairs and the van is coming to pick the band up. We're going to the airport, and I'm checking out of my room. And as I'm about to get on the van, I, I just think about it for a second. I say, you know, I better check because I don't know. I know Sweden's very liberated and things like that, but I don't know what the what the uh, sexual harassment laws are like or anything like that. So. I, I decide, um, I'll check with the front desk, and I ask for the manager, and I explain the whole thing to the manager, and the manager's eyes are like this, and I'm thinking, oh, I really did something bad. He said, wait a minute, you don't want this. I said, well, no, you know, it's Delta Airlines, they're not really gonna be able to know what to do with it. I got too many glass phalluses in my house to begin with, I have no place to right. put it, you know. <laughs> would I offend the man? He said, no, no, what I would really like, would you make it as a gift to the hotel? We will put it in a display case, because we're very proud of our, our glass blown piece. <laughs> You got it, no problem. So he makes me a key, I go upstairs, take it downstairs, I present, he said, oh, the band must sign it. So I take out a copper Sharpie, and I run up to the van, and the van's like, Joe, we're waiting, let's go, come on, chop, chop. I'm like, guys, just a second, you gotta sign, what do you mean, we just, so I'll explain to you on the way to the airport. They sign it, takes it back, I hand it to him, I forget about it. That's what, life in the rock and roll business sometimes, the, the incredible, bizarre stuff comes at you so fast, and you don't even remember. remember. So that was 2012. Last summer, 2018, six years later, a friend of mine is telling me a story about his birthday party and how he got this, <laughs> this big crystal boot that you're supposed to drink beer out of and there's a whole movie called Das Keg or something, I don't know. But it's a, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, Crystal, I, it reminds me of something. And when he finishes, I went, wait, I have a story. And I tell the story, I start to tell the story in a bar on the Upper West Side of New York, the Upper Upper West Side of New York. I'm telling this story in what is essentially a blue collar bar. And I get about three sentences into it. And I hear a distinctly Scandinavian voice say, oh, I've seen that in the hotel lobby, right? This girl grew up there right. in this and neighborhood. So I remember it's that. apparently yes. still on display. It's still on display. So if you're hotel. ever in, in um, North Shopping, Sweden, check out the hotels. And one of them has the most unique piece of Twisted Sister memorabilia that ever existed. There's only one of them. There is only one of them. There's only one. That big and beautiful. Be oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> So yes, just that, wanted to throw that one out there because that, that one's that good. was a story. I remember that. Yes. You know, and it's it's an incredible what you really forget at times. That's you know, to me that was the, the the biggest point of the story. Something like that happens to most people. Yeah, it's something you remember a while. I completely forgot, forgot about, about it, it the moment after I got in the it van. It goes by so and that was fast. It. You forget about these things. Yeah. It really does. So we had to kind of remind by. each other. So some yes, of stuff. we did as we were going back and forth. You know, and I'm getting this list from Joe and uh, half of the things I'm going I, I, what does this mean <laughs> well, what close. does this mean and I, I think I did the same thing to Joe on quite a few yes. points but uh, the first one is Gang Frank oh Gang Frank okay Gang Frank we had a production manager named Frank Rubino Frank was about yay tall 
zero point two percent body fat on him, yeah. no hair, soft, most soft spoken guy you'd ever seen. We we pulled him out. He was the day manager at one of the bars we played in. And we actually he became he was George Thurgood's production manager. He became a world class production him. manager. Yeah, we hired him, but we well, hired him, taught us. him the ropes, of course, and he. Um, he was just the sweetest guy in the world. He was so unlike what you, what most rock and roll touring dogs are like, um, and he was incredibly hardworking, and um, just sweet, and just so ill placed amongst us ruffians. So it started. Well. Eddie would walk over, and you remember he's bald, and Eddie would go, "Hi, Frank," like All that, right, you know. Smack him on the. It's smack him on the head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know. And then everybody would go over and take turns. Hi, Frank. Right, and then, Smack him on his ball. And then the usual, you know, like right. that with the right. back. Right. And then you start with the chanting, you know, Frank, 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 Frank. You to the Frank, tune Frank. of "Lovely Span, Wonderful, Wonderful Span." Let's let, let, just a little, a little, a little add thing here. <laughs> Twisted Sister quite often was like a bunch of fifteen-year-olds at sleepaway oh, camp. Completely, <laughs> completely. That's that's really where this is going because it's, it's often of it was like that. It was just sheer stupidity and comedy. Yeah. And we'd be on a tour bus, and Frank would finally come in. We'd be waiting for him. And Frank, Frank, Frank. And we'd just dog pile on him and scream Frank, for, yeah. scream his name. But it really hit the, the apex when we were touring in a tour bus. And Frankie, who, was, of course, was up earlier than anybody else and go, the last guy on the bus, would finally get in the bus, and he'd finally lay down. And um, I would just kind of pull the curtain back in his bunk right before he went. Just give him a few minutes to just start to fall asleep. And pull the curtain back and go, Frank. Frank, you busy? I got to talk to you. And I would climb in his bunk. Now these are very small coffins. They're bunks, bunks on a tour bus. They're they're, they're six feet long, uh, two feet wide, and about a- equivalent to a coffin that ceiling. had the side opening. Yes, in it. it's, a, it's a side a side loading coffin. Right. I'd climb in with him and start talking to him. Frank. Listen, on the show tonight, and before I get three words in, Eddie would be behind me, and he would climb and say, "Frank, listen, I had a tuning problem." And then JJ would, and then D would, and then Mark would come in, and we would just just you would try to fit everybody <laughs> in the bunk. And to the boy, it's amazing we didn't Cliff Burton him. Oh man, right, yeah. push him right to right That's hard. Other. That's cold. Oh, That's oh cold. yeah. Oh sure. Now oh, I found I found the line. Cliff right. Burton. Okay. I yeah. Okay. <laughs> so bunking, Frank. That's that's what's known as bunking. There's, there's gang franking and there's bunking. Right. Um, it, 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 yeah, it was just really... These guys, he, for as outgoing a performing act as they were, they were incredibly insular outside. Of, when they weren't on stage, they didn't want to know about anything. They were... Um, they had spent 10 years, in some cases, minimum seven years, to get to where they got. They were not going to mess up this chance. So when we got out to get in front of a national audience, Everything went into preparation and performance for the show. And the moment that show ended, everything started to prepare and, and be ready for the next show. And they were serious as a heart attack about it. And it showed in the perform- performances. But unfortunately, in the rock and roll world in the early 80s, <laughs> that was not the norm. No, of course So, not. So people would come, like local representatives of the record company when you're out in various parts, when you're out in various parts of the country, local representatives of the record company would come and they'd be blown away and they'd, they'd want to go to the party because these guys are wild. They're great. There's going to be a great party. And they would show up and there'd be nothing going on. Be, we used to joke about um, tumbleweed through the going going through the, the aisles of the on arenas. The tour, uh, yes. um, but oh, actually, all when we, when we the would find, there'd be people we'd ha- the band would have to meet, record company people, right. radio station people, and uh, the guys got very good at spending a minimum amount of time without making them feel bad. And part of it was this fraternity-like level of abuse. Uh, there was a famous Olympian named Mary Decker, who had been knocked out of the Olympics in 84. I don't know if you remember this. I remember it. Uh, because she had been tripped by a South African runner named Zola Budd, inadvertently, but it cost her her place in the race. And so tour buses are narrow. The front lounge has two couches facing each other. A rep would bring somebody in, a very important uh, radio station person, and we'd get him get halfway in, and then as soon as he started to move backwards, you'd hear Zola, Zola, Zola. And these guys would start Zola. running a gauntlet, and k- kicking them, tripping them, knocking them on their face. But it got him out of the bus really quickly, which was the goal. The best one, the best after effect of this is we were in Chicago. We were touring with Queensryche. Right. Oh, yeah. I know where you're going with this Yeah, this one's... Oh, boy. (laughs) I think I can keep this one on the right side of the line. Go ahead. Try it. Okay. Try it. Um, We're playing a club in Chicago. 
we, had, we, had, we were done with the tour for uh, Can't Stop Rock and Roll, but we were asked to go out again because they wanted a good influence on Queensryche, who were like 17 at the time, most of them. And they, they wanted a band to tour with where they get a little experience and see the right way to do things. And it was, a, it was, it was a compliment that Twisted was chosen, but we went out and played about eight dates with them, one of which was in Chicago. Uh, I was at a nightclub, and after the club, we hadn't been to, Twisted had not played Chicago at that point, I don't think, except on the Blackfoot Croakers thing where the, right. the rep had spent all his time with Blackfoot and didn't right. really know didn't, us. Didn't want to know us. So the rep had really seen us for the first time, and uh, he showed up at the gig, was totally blown away. We spent some time with him afterwards, went back to the hotel. Of course, we're staying at the Howard Johnson's on the other side of town, so nobody finds us because... And we, we couldn't afford anything else. Well, and also we didn't want to be bothered, you know, was a big part of it. I had made a new friend that night in Chicago. I was single at the time, so I'm, gonna, I'm in my room making friends with this girl. And it's two in the morning, and I'm not even in my room. Excuse me, I'm not even. I'm not even in my room because I was rooming with D at the time. I was in. Or was I still rooming with JJ? I JJ. Have, I was, I was rooming, rooming with JJ, with but I got my own room because I don't want. You know, JJ doesn't that need to listen to this, right? So, I'm getting to know my new friend, and there's a rap on the door. And it's, I'm allowed to tell this because I had this conversation with him years later. He says, okay, to use his name. His name was Rick Sudikoff. Rick Sudikoff. He later on became a VP in Atlantic Records. Very important man in the record business. At the time, he was just a local field rep. It's banging on the door. Garber, open up. Wow, who is it? He says, Sudikoff. He says, what are you doing here? He says, just open the door. So I go to the door. <coughs> he says to me, Looking for the party. I said, I told you at the show, Rick, no party. These guys don't party. We got another show tomorrow night. We're resting. He says, I don't believe you. Open up. So I open the latch. You know, I put the latch on. I open the door a little bit. He sticks his head in. He doesn't see anything. He says, open the door. So fine. I unlatch it. He, I'm wearing a towel. My new friend is sitting in bed. All, just all you see is eyes and bangs above the sheets, right? <laughs> and um, he bursts in the room, looks around, and I'm thinking, good, now I'll finally leave. It's dark. It's quiet. He says, I still don't believe you. I said, what on earth are you talking about, Rick? He say, he, with that, he takes his thumb. This, I have a witness, so I know this happened, and he admitted it later. He peels back the skin underneath his thumbnail. He takes his thumb. He reaches his thumb into my nose. He takes his thumbnail. He scrapes the mucous membrane around my nostril, pulls it out of my nose, sticks it in his mouth, goes, oh, never mind, and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> actually happened. happened. When people talk about, oh, some of that stuff's apocryphal, <laughs> that one, you cannot make up. Yeah, that happened. He admitted it to me. Uh, yeah. He did. Yeah, no, because it, 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 it had to be, up. even for him, it had to be the, you he, talk he, about somebody Jones. He was looking for the party, oh, and he was upset <laughs> the next day when I saw him that there was no party. Oh, yeah. You know, um, th th talking about a story like that, and we'll move on to yeah. some, some other crazy things. <laughs> Something a little Real, more. Well, I mean, a story just like that, though. You remember when we headlined that concert? Um, I can't remember what tour it was on, but it was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Albuquerque. Alba Albuquerque. Right. Or Al Albuquerque. Right. right. Albuquerque. <laughs> the promoter went to you, do you remember what he said? He said, I have hookers, drugs, and alcohol lined up. Right. You remember that? I, vague, yes. oh so vaguely. He was not so much a concert promoter as a sports, a boxing promoter. Yeah. He was trying his hand at concerts. Yeah. Sold the place out. He wanted the, the band to party. <laughs> so he said to you, I, don't, I remember I don't you coming to me and saying this. Um, I would have come to you because nobody else would have made it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he said, um, so-and-so has hookers, <laughs> drugs, and alcohol for you guys. And I said to Joe, what are we going to do with that? <laughs> this, you would figure this, that everybody knows. There's only two of us. Be. Yeah. Right. No, I'm just, just saying. Uh, it, it was like that, and Joe goes, and you were saying, I, I, I don't want I to said, offend them. Listen, I probably was worried I, about offending tell him, them. Tell him, be honest, tell him thank you, but no thank you. Um, maybe there's something else we could do. He came back to us because he owned a Grand Prix racetrack. You remember that? Yes. Yes. So he oh. came back to Joe and said, "Well, uh, you know, you drive these mini gas cars and you race around the track, and oh, there's some rides talking. and stuff there." But he said, "Look, I own a Grand Prix racetrack. I'll open it. We'll have a barbecue, and you guys can stay there all night." 
So, of course, everybody goes. Some guys can't even drive cars. <laughs> but it's just so happens some that city Joe kids. can, and I can, and D so, uh, can, and AJ could. And we raced these things and had a barbecue until oh, the blast. sun came up. That was a blast. And this guy was like, I was ready to spend <laughs> he was, thousands of that, dollars right. on a he, he was ready to spend about 20 grand on hookers and blow. Yeah, on, 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 he got on, off for, like, you know, the electricity it cost to run a go-kart Yeah, and track. he brought some of his employees over to yeah. party with us, and they had a great barbecue. It was amazing. That was great. That was the, the only time. I remember, the <laughs> sun is coming yeah. up, and I'm going, man, we got we to show in Phoenix. Yeah, we had to be in Phoenix. Yeah, we had a show. So Phoenix. yeah, but that's that. That's an example of some of the things that would happen. But that, yeah, that, but yeah, it, yeah. That was a long night. It was a great night. That, that was, was a great fun. night. That was a great night. Yeah, wrecked a lot of cars. <laughs> yes, a lot of cars. Wrecked yeah, a lot. There, there are advantages a lot to, of cars. to being with a rock band. Without, yes. without a doubt, a lot of cars. Anyway, um, part of the stories and some of the things in the early days. Um, it, let's go right back to the club days. Uh, a story that uh, <laughs> I had to actually explain what it meant, even though it's quite simple when you think about it to Laura yesterday um, we were in Middletown the uh -huh. band was playing oh. I think it was at a club and the, it, was ru it was rumors for a while it was named after two Fleetwood Mac songs originally it was rumors, rumors and then then it was something else it was called um uh, but in any case, we had to stay overnight. Yes. All right. Well, and no, we, we would do the run. We would do. Right. Well, we stayed in a hotel because right. we weren't going to drive all the way home and right. go to the next thing. So it actually had time. snowed. Remember that? It snowed at and night. Then it, then it, we then were in two rental cars. Yes. The, one of the few times in the club days we didn't use our own car. We're at Howard, Howard Johnson's. Right. We're in Howard Catch Johnson's. The theme. We're in, <laughs> right. Howard <laughs> Johnson's, of course. And it's got to be about, I don't know, 8 o'clock in the Now, here's morning. the thing you need to understand. Mark, we're. we're, we're Everybody in this band and crew, we go to sleep at 5 or 6 in the morning. We wake up between 11 and 1 in the afternoon. That's our routine. Mark, in those days, never slept, ever. No. So Doing silly, crazy silly things crazy. constantly. But the rest dangerous of dangerous things. Yes, the rest of but, us need our sleep. So uh, it, it snowed. It, it actually, the, the first level of snow turned to ice. It's actually better from snow. my perspective. Right, exactly. I think. You think so? I think so. I, I'm in my okay, room. I'll let I'm you go fast away. asleep. My phone rings. I look at the clock. It's eight in the morning. I've been asleep for three hours. Oh, who do you want? Uh, yes, this is the manager. <laughs> Straighten up. What's the matter? Everything okay? Oh, it, what? Yes and no. One of the men in your in your entourage, Mr. Mr. Atlantis, I think he was still calling me in those days. Uh, we're going to have to call the cops on. I said, what do you mean you have to call the cops? Who? What? Tell me. He says, well, one of the guys in your in your entourage has um, has stolen a car. And is he has taken that car and he's in the parking lot outside the restaurant and he is pushing somebody else's car like a T-bone. He's pushing it around the frozen parking lot, just doing figure eights and circles and you know. Let me clarify that. <laughs> if this is Joe's car and, and no, and this is, we don't know whose car it is yet. Well, all right, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. So, I'll let you but get but that. essentially, if this, if this is one car and the, he, he's pushing it around like this, right? Obviously, you got to call. I, so I said, wait a minute. Is he driving a white um, Granada? Yes. And is he pushing around a peach-colored Thunder? Yes. Okay. It's, there are cars. It's fine. Don't worry. He'll get tired and, and go away soon. And sure enough, as I get ready to hear the phone, I hear somebody say, oh, it looks like he's left. And he had, in the meantime, he had pushed the car, he had pushed my car back into the same spot where he had started. Just... <laughs> The cars were parked nose to nose <laughs> by the front doors of the of the, the the hotel, right next to where the restaurant was. So I come out, I'm bored. Eight in the morning, nobody else is up. Because the other part of the parking lot was very empty. So all I was going to do was spin around in circles and do all kinds of tricks with the rent a car. And I did that a few times, and people were watching me from the restaurant. You know, there was tons of people at the window looking at me, you know. And their, their faces. That didn't somewhere. bother them, though. They were okay no, with no, that. they were okay with that. So I come back, <laughs> and I'm ready to park the car and go back to the hotel, except I put it nose to nose with Joe's car. I push his car out of the spot. I back up. <laughs> And I come around and I go against the, the passenger doors and start pushing the car sideways around the parking lot. And I, I did it probably eight or ten or twelve times. That sounds about you know. Right. And like Joe said, he, yeah, he would get tired and stop. Eventually, well, I stopped over here, went behind pushed the car, it back. pushed it back in the spot, and Returned put my car back spot. nose to nose. And I walk into the lobby of the hotel. Of course, everybody's watching me now. I walk back in, and a couple of people actually went. You know, like like fun show and everything it like was that. I hadn't realized that they called Joe's room because they knew it was Joe's. I was always was the only thing that ever room. worried me when we were in hotels was what Mark was doing between like five and ten before the, <laughs> before the crew got up, 
because when he didn't have anybody to play with, it was it was dangerous. Things, yeah, I, I had it was dangerous. To play with, yes. Um, there was another time I remember pulling up in front of Lamore. Uh, after a snowstorm. Lamore, uh, for everybody who doesn't know out there watching, Lamore, it's the infamous Lamore in Brooklyn. Yes, in right? Bay Ridge, uh, very Bay famous Ridge, club. Brooklyn, Lamore, that uh, a oh. lot of people played at that time. It was a legendary heavy metal club. Yes. Right. And we had actually opened for rock and roll, as right. we twisted. Right. But it, become, it became, I mean, all the biggies played there. Every, every big. Uh, and it was it was sort of what CBGB's was to punk, Lamore was to, to metal. Uh, right after a snowstorm, my car didn't start, so we rented a car, me and Jay. AJ, and uh, pulled up in front of Lamore, and you were beating us there because we had to get to rent the car. And we pulled up in a, in a, and it just snowed. Pulled up in a strange vehicle, which you recognized immediately, screamed, valet parking, reached in, pulled me out through the window, then opened the door, got in, I took, took off, off down the block. Next thing I know, he is coming back, and as he goes by, he screams, I wonder which one of these is the hydrant, and he starts slamming into snowbanks snow on the yeah, sidewalk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. playing out, chicken because you know sooner or later one of them is going to have a fire hydrant <laughs> but it's a rented car he knows I took the CDW because I'm going to be seeing him right. so it's all good yeah, well, yes, and I didn't find the fire. You never, thank goodness. No, no, but I did spin it around. And yeah, you did. You did some beautiful spot. donuts. You know, yes. just quickly about that. Um, our good friend Ann. Yes. So uh, at those days, she worked for she Avis. Worked for, thank God. And she always had a rent a car. And it was that summer. I remember she came home with a rent a car, brand new, <laughs> something. And uh, we were all going out, and uh, I'll drive. <laughs> so we were all going out locally to local bars. It was a, it was like a Monday night or something. The night that T.S. wasn't playing, and it was. Had have been six or seven people stuffed in the car. I went in reverse. <laughs> I never used the drive. <laughs> Down side streets, major roads, just took the chance. The man went is in the reverse. best driver I've ever Everywhere seen. Everywhere I went, I went in reverse. I've seen a lot Everywhere of good. Everywhere went in reverse. And she just <laughs> sat there in the front seat. Well, she okay, knew you at that just, point. That's just the way it goes. That's just the way you it goes. You shouldn't have showed. He, that, you, knew, just, if you knew what Mark was like around a car. Speaking of driving, it started with dictators, but the bumps. You, yes, you oh. had a tradition. Oh, I forgot about that. You travel in two rental cars. You got the lead vehicle and the trailing vehicle. Mark established the tradition. Mark always wanted me to drive lead because he liked driving trail. Because if we get to a traffic light, he would bump me at about five, six miles an hour. <laughs> now, yeah. ostensibly to annoy me, but really it was good because I knew he was still behind me. <laughs> you know? Uh, but the reactions you would get in the daytime, you'd be sitting at a traffic light. Excuse me. <clears throat> you'd be si sitting at a traffic light right. and I always would wait. I would love traffic lights because I'd, I'd always try and be where I could see the eyes of the people next to me because I know I'm going to get slammed and everybody's going to look and, like, and point or what did you see what he did? And then it's fine and then just drive off. And then the one time coming back from uh, from Beaumont, Texas to home <laughs> in the middle of the night on I-81, we pulled off for gas and Mark had been trailing me the whole way. We get to the light, pulling in for gas, and I'm, everybody's braced. Everybody in the car, well, you know, you know if you you're reading a magazine, you know, you're expe nothing happens. Turns out we had lost them, I don't know, 50 miles back in the middle of the night. We had no money. I'd given all the money to Frank. We had, we had played the, we, had, we played Austin, Houston, Beaumont, Cardis. Right. It was the end of the Blackford Caucus run in right. 83. Right. And we realized if we drove at warp speed, we didn't have the truck with us because that had a limiter on it. Right. Um, if we drove like 900 miles an hour, we could be back and give ourselves almost a full extra day off right. before we had to go back out again. So we decided to go for it. We gave all the money and the CBs to Frankie and just set off up I-81, you know, well, eventually up I-81 in, in, the, in right. the Blue Ridge. Of course. We lost you guys, yes. and I knew they didn't have a nickel. I had just enough money for gas money to get both of us home, and I'm in one car, and they're not with us, and it was... That was that was a scary hour or two. Yeah, I found you guys. You well, we found each other. We right. we just started driving up by the flashing brights, and right. you know, eventually we, and then he did a nice J turn across the medium, and <laughs> boom, we were off again. <laughs> and we saw yes. the Lincoln Tunnel just that's after sunrise right. that day. After yeah. sunrise that day, craziness. Um, also, uh, another funny one is uh, when we finally graduated to a larger vehicle. Oh, the RV. We had the RV. Ooh. And that RV for the. 
the short period of time we had, it was infamous for a lot of things. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, my goodness! Just, just ridiculous. Um, as D is really good at telling this story, but uh, he's not on with right. us tonight. Um, when, when I do have him on, I'll make sure he you tells have the story. But we were driving, and I couldn't. We're in the Midwest someplace, and um, I believe it was either you or he had the keys. You were going to drive because I drove most of the time. Right, you drove the first. Right. Line, I was yes. going to. It was a long ride. I was going to take a take a right. sleep first. Right, and I either you went and you guys got in the RV and you turn the key and nothing happened, okay? So immediately everybody thinks the battery's dead. Uh, so I walk up and D and Joe are all saying to me already, hey, listen, we're going to have a problem here with this. It won't start. Flip the headlights on. All the lights come on nice and bright. Turn the key. Nothing happens. Okay, so... <laughs> Either the starter solenoids burned out or something along the way there. So for the automotive nuts out there, it was an actual GM chassis with a big block of 444 in it and a a turbo 400 transmission with an overdrive. So being an automotive guy, I knew the system as well, even though I never worked on the RV per se. So I'm looking around, and there's a construction site. Right next to us. It's like a railroad construction site. And in railroads, they use heavy cable, you know, for signaling. They use big double O cable. So I, I calm down, guys. I'll be right back. I got so this. I walk over to this construction site. And again, there was no one working, but it was all track and railroad ties and everything laying there. And there is cable. And there is a toolbox that's not locked. And I, there's a hacksaw there. And I, I hack off about a, an eight inch piece of this cable. And I, take the insulation off the ends and, and grab the pliers and twist it really tight and I bend it into a U shape So I, and I climb, I grab cardboard, I go underneath the RV and I said to Joe who's sitting in the driver's seat, just turn the key to the on position. Okay, it's on. I get under there and I touch the solenoid connections and there you go. We're good to go, guys. Let's go. Back in there. So. It, it, it was on the way out. We were going from, <laughs> from Long Island to the first date of the Blackfoot Crocus Tour, which was, which was Salt, Salt Lake, Lake City. City. So yes. this happened somewhere in Illinois, I think. Somewhere in Illinois. At, the, the next couple of times, I think we had to stop for gas one more time. Yeah. And we had to start it up again that way. Yeah. We get to the gig. We play the show. Michael Brannon was the first field member. Michael Brannan. Yes, from out of Denver. He's yes. covering Salt Lake. He, like every rep on that tour, was blown away. Can't believe, why did the label tell us you were coming? You guys are, fe- well, it's a long story. Doug Morris, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, really exactly. just didn't like us. But um, I, I've got like 20. It's, it's, it is not only is it a, a, a bus tour, you know, it's, it's an arena tour, so it's routed for buses, but it was the last arena tour booked, which meant they didn't get their choice of dates. They had to t- take whatever date was available in whatever facilities. So the routing goes across here, then it was down like here. Throwing a dart. Like it was a dart. What's known as a dartboard it really tour. Really was. <laughs> so there were five, six, seven hundred mile runs almost every night. So we're going on at. 10 to 7, finishing at 7.30, we've got to get in the van and drive at warm speed in the RV just to get like a couple hours sleep when we get to the next gig. So, but when the rep comes back, he wants to meet the band. I remember I did this twice on, on... on that tour, it, I introduced the four guys, and then I introduced Mark, who was under the RV, my and he shakes his out, he shakes his foot, my boot up, <laughs> right, and he shakes my boot, shakes my boot. the van. Somebody turned the key on. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go, Michael. See okay, you. let's and go. we're off. So our key was this big <laughs> yes. double R key, yes. um, you, and you couldn't steal it because it wasn't going to start. It wasn't going to. You start. know, not that we cared if anybody stole it, but this is what I carried for yeah. for a, a few weeks. That was until well, it was a good, uh, did, I think. About ten days before no, it finally died. Was, it was it was closer to, to like two and a half. Yeah, weeks. well, it, it, di- it died on the. It died. It died right. We out had a fire in it, and the engine engine compartment was inside the inside yeah, the, the passenger inside the compartment. Passenger part of the that place. was fun, and then it finally died it right died. on the right on the um, New Mexico Utah border. Right, it died right out. Mexico of Raton, Colorado border. Right, right, right yeah. outside of Raton, New Mexico. Right outside of Raton, New Mexico. On a Sunday morning, and it was yeah. 110 degrees outside. Yes, yes. So yeah, that blew the transmission in it, and yeah, and that. Was it? We abandoned ship, <laughs> and we we rented Switched two cars. Ugly duckling ran a car. Ugly duckling ran a Pistol Mangino. Pistol Mangino was his real name. Yes. The guy who owned the place opened up on at, at eight o'clock on a Sunday, Sunday morning, morning in Raton, to rent us New Mexico. Two cars. Yeah, it was unbelievable stuff. D, so, stay in the RV. Do yeah, not D, get out under any we're circumstances. In, we're definitely in redneck territory. Yeah. In any case, <laughs> in any case, yeah, we had to make D stay. You yep. stay in the RV. D and Eddie were told yeah, just just stay in the RV. You we know, got this. Uh, Charlie. We didn't want. Charlie out, we remember? Charlie yeah. out, 
outside. Our sound man at the time outside. Yeah, the so three me, guys. That I had a big head of curly hair. Yeah. But I tied it back, yeah. put on a cat diesel power, uh, you know, wore a tank top, and I blended in with yeah. everybody in the area. So it, it didn't matter except yeah. for my accent was in New York. But in any case, but the RV, okay. Um, again, we were an opening band and didn't make much money. And while we were driving long distances, especially during the day. There really wasn't anything to do. So, uh, being that it was a very funny band with a lot of boisterous guys in the band, um, we came up with a card game. We didn't have much money or any money really to gamble with, but Joe was very instrumental in coming up with insult poker. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. There insult was insult poker. As as I've alluded to before. The dressing room for Twisted Sister was like a locker room. Yeah. Oh. It's the only way to describe it. And if you've ever been in a real locker room, there's a lot of abuse going on. That's how guys express love is by making fun of things that the rest of the guys are most sensitive about. So um, I realized since we didn't have any money, we could assign various insult levels to uh, everybody individually. And it was very complicated because it required a really intricate scoring system because it boiled down to one-on-one -on, -one on everybody. So if I won a hand, I might have won three red level insults against him, two red level insults against D, and one yeah, red level. I have to understand that Joe came up with this very <laughs> elaborate it was very scoring elaborate. system. I don't which, know. Without describing the insults, I don't know that this story works. No, but you have to understand this is what we did. And, and well, you have nothing better to paid, do. Yeah. We, we had nothing. We couldn't bet money. I mean, but we'd had none. The point was is that if you lost to somebody, there was a period of time based on how much the equivalent bet had been where you couldn't make fun of a certain thing about that person. So I'll use myself as an example. I have a big there nose. Was, there was college level calculus and algebra. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit. It was a, quite a bit of math. It was the quite, scoring a, system. quite a bit of math. I'll use myself as an example. If you won white chips against me, every white chip was an hour. You couldn't make a big nose joke. Okay? <laughs> For example, um, Every, every blue chip was a day you couldn't make fun of my ethnic background. Um, every red chip was a week you couldn't make fun of the fact that I would pretend to be gay all the time, right? Um, because it, as we were talking about with the club owners, right. right? So, but that sort of became, those were the things that people would always ragging on me for. So, um, and everybody had their own particular uh, sensitivities, although I didn't really, I certainly wasn't sensitive about that, but if you know, if somebody nails it good, even if you're not sensitive about it, it you still feel a little twinge. So, um, <laughs> twinge. You know, it's a little bit. So, at the end of the game, which lasted I don't know a good eight nine hours, I handed easily, everybody. Easily. I, I I retired to the back of the RV, did all the math, and came back about an hour later, and everybody was given a, a cheat sheet. Okay, for the next three hours, you can't say anything about Joe's nose. And he can't say anything about this. And then for the next two days, and 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 for weeks, I don't know how and, he came up with this system. Eddie had one. I'm, I'm sorry, D had won a big hand against Eddie. Yeah, okay. the one really big hand that we had, where they both had great cards, and uh, <laughs> D had like three or four weeks on Eddie, right? Where he owned Eddie, and Eddie couldn't say anything to him. And D, D utilized that time very effectively. Oh, he did. He and did without every doubt, waking did. moment, he was giving it to, to Eddie. Eddie. And Eddie couldn't say anything. It was driving him crazy. Yeah. Oh, and because we had established this is really a dollar, this is really $5, this is $25, I remember the day I finally gave out per diems. Yes. I was finally able to give out per diems, which was $35 a week or whatever. And Eddie had been waiting for this day. He had saved his per, per diem from the week before. And as soon as he got his hands on per diem, he went over to D and just stuck his face in and waited in the moment D let him have it, he took all the money out that he had and threw it at D because he knew he was paying off the equivalent and then just attacked him Barraged like him. like a so pro wrestler so with a folding chair. Just <laughs> went at him <laughs> like you wouldn't believe. It, it was, was hilarious. Just, and this went on, you know, for the whole time, the two and a half oh, weeks in this RV. Oh, yeah. Every time everybody was away 
awake, <laughs> you know, there was no television to watch. Right, and, like and, you'd, oh, and you'd start to say something, you realize, oh, I can't say that. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. And you constantly were the referee. No, yeah. no, 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 look no. at the list. <laughs> you cannot do that. I read, I was yeah, the arbiter, yeah. yes. No, JJ, you can say something <laughs> right. now. No, Mark, you can't. No, Mark, you can't. <laughs> right. Oh, it, it was great. And I, quite often, while we were playing, I was driving. You were just, absolutely. I was still driving. They were playing right next to me. Yes. Everybody was crushed in the front seat of the of the RV, and uh, and I'll be playing. But you know, it, it, stuff is uh, is is very funny. Yeah, you get Go. things. You th you spend enough time in a confined space with with large men who have a sense of humor, <laughs> and weird things will happen. It's just unavoidable. You know, you you put down one here, and uh, you explained it to me the other day because I had fo forgotten about it. But you said, boy, dog. Garbage oh, can, yes. garbage can. Now that was on the come out and play tour, like right? Play. Boy, but dog was uh, was a, a very good uh, crew member of ours. He was one play. of the crew members that had been back with us in the club in the days. Club days. Was, he his had graduated. Name was John Forrest, and he might even be listening right now. And, and hello, John. Hey, uh, but boy, what's dog. Happened to BD? That's right. But uh, he was. He made it all the way through. He, he did. Very, he very few people made it from it club days. It was a rough crowd to be with us that to, to, to arenas, but he did. And So uh, Joe reminded me that... Uh, but Mark was always uh, just horrifically difficult to the people that worked for him. Deliberately. Because just, just to annoy for them. For sport. Yeah, just for uh, sport. Because it entertained everybody else. No, it never changed. Some, and yes, right, never some changed. things have no, never changed. Never changed. And John, boy dog, was the, was the tech on Mark's side of the stage. Even though Mark had his own bass tech for that tour, Paul Spriggs. Spriggs was a fairly solid guy, and yeah. you know, probably could have given you a decent run. I would have. And he was pretty. He had he had been a tour man. He was like he was a little bit too much of a pro. Boy Dog had been there from the beginning. Yeah. And the abuse was. Uh, I mean, Boy Dog would come out. Boy Dog would come out to fix something on AJ's drums. Yes, and he wouldn't let him off the stage. It, yeah, not only that, but he'd jump on the drum riser and, and squat down to do it, and I'd immediately de pants him. Right. right take his he was wearing sweats, and right. that's it. Nothing. And right. then he would grab it. He would grab to pull. <laughs> Of his pants, and then AJ he, would he, smash the symbol. Right. It would go down again. Right. Then know. AJ would so break the this symbol. Would go back so and he, forth and back and forth. It was like know. he was playing his own personal game of whack a mole. Yeah, exactly. exactly. And uh, so that's that's. But he true. would torture. But on that the set for come out and play, being twisted, we didn't understand that you could actually make pieces that look like things that didn't weigh as much. So when we needed a chain link fence, we used when we needed real corrugated, we used real corrugated. We, we needed a car, a junk car. It was we, a real. It was an junk actually. It had its. It was half a truck just for a junk car. It was, it was unbelievable. And we used... Um, we had, uh, if we, everybody remembers, when we were much younger, you could you had galvanized garbage bales. Yes. Right? And we had a bunch that were painted with graffiti, and we left them on the stage. And I would throw they were part them of the around set, at, people, at the guys in the crew. I'd right. toss it at them and stuff. But one day I stuck <laughs> <laughs> I stuck uh, uh, John Forrest, boy dog, in a garbage bale and rolled it off the stage. <laughs> Six foot high stage. Six foot high stage, yeah. Rolled it right off the stage. Yeah. Well, Mark also on that tour, Mark had a bit that was behind him. He, the set was a junkyard with a chain link fence, and then it had um, chicken wire on top of it. And um, his tech was set up right behind there on the on the deck on the floor behind the stage. And when during the band introduction introductions near the end of the of the set, when Mark would be introduced, Mark would hold his bass up, take it, throw it over 30 feet in the air over. over this wall. Right. It would disappear, and then he'd take a bow, right? And the show within the show was behind the... The, the rest of the crew <laughs> would be on the other My side of the wall, watching Paul <laughs> Spriggs, like, trying to figure His, out where it was coming right, from, and, you know. And because, when, when he found... Because the, unlike a pass at football where you see right, right, right. the quarterback, you couldn't see the quarterback. Because it was corrugated. And so, I would purposely <laughs> throw it someplace different. Well, initially, he would just throw it straight over. Then when he found out that Paul was catching it every night, yeah. which was kind of making him angry. Yeah. He 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 would start to vary where he'd throw it. And then he found out that Paul would put eye black on and a baseball yeah, right, hat right, and he'd back there right. like this. And sometimes he'd come like to a, the front of the stage like, like that. And the last one I remember was you, you saw Paul's eyes peeking right. and you, you went like this. Right. And then threw it the other no way. way. And you, what you didn't see was him racing behind the stage. And doing the dive. He did a diving catch and on caught it. it. 
<laughs> yeah. I never let it hit the never ground hit once. once. <laughs> never no, never it was, once. It was it one was of the great pro. catches of all. And he you're was, catching a bass guitar that weighs yeah. how much one of those things weigh? Yeah, it was pretty heavy. About 40 I, pounds, yeah, maybe? Yeah. yeah. I don't know about that much, but they were heavy. They were you actually, did throw it neck first once, too. That was yes, funny. Yes, I did. I threw it the neck only first once. once. Yeah, only but yeah, once. I would just toss this thing, and he couldn't see it. and It would come out of the lights. Yeah. But it was the best part of the show was watching Paul try and catch the bass. Yeah, I mean, you watch baseball, and you see the outfield, right? And they, you know the arc of the ball. It's yeah. coming. Even if you're a receiver, wide you've receiver. You've seen it hit the bat. In football. You've done it thousands you of times. You see it, right? You right. run out there and see it. But imagine throwing something big as a bass guitar. There is no Little League where you get the muscle memory to catch a bass guitar coming out of lights. <laughs> well, you lights. can't see it. Yes. And it comes past the lights. So you're right. looking. It's like, what's... Yeah, so... And yeah, you've got ball. about 25 feet and however... What is that? Second? Second yeah. and a quarter? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would to toss decide. this thing. Yeah. Very, very funny stuff. But the, uh, one of the funny ones here, too, is you have... Hello, Detroit. Oh, hello. <laughs> this is actually part of a larger thing. Right. Um, one of the things Twisted always pride themselves on that I always pride myself on, actually, never make the same mistake twice. Right. So you make right. a mistake, you own it, you move on. We're in... Uh, this is during a Dio tour, so we've tour. we've been through um, we've been through the Midwest once. We've played the sheds in the summertime. There are these outdoor sheds. Um, sheds are amphitheaters. They're amphitheaters. They're adjustable. There was one. There was one called Pine Knob and one called Poplar Creek. 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 I think Pine Knob was in Detroit and Poplar Creek was in, but I I'm not sure because they looked identical. Yeah, yeah, they, they both really started with P. Chicago, Detroit, similar. City. We're at we're in Chicago. No, we're in Detroit. Detroit. We're in Detroit. D goes out on stage. It's still daylight because we're special guests. It's the summertime. He looks out and he says, and he recognizes whichever one it is. He goes, hello, Chicago. Like that. Nothing. We, we look at him on It was stage. a spinal tap moment, right? D, D we're in Detroit. We're in, we're in Detroit. Okay? So, and this is without drugs or alcohol because he right, never did right. anything. Yeah. The he next, just had the, the wrong next city. The next night, if you go out to the drum riser, there's a big pink card with the name of the city underlined. So we never did that again. Now, we're back indoors. We're playing in Phoenix. And we get to the part of the show, the breakdown of, I guess it was I Want to Rock, where we're going to, where if, if a part of the audience or a particular person isn't, I've got all, I'm running lights at this point. The house lights are up. The band can see everybody in the building. Uh, and they can see if anybody's not into it. It's something the band has been doing since club days when they used to take flashlights and isolate people who weren't particularly into it. But now we have we have six 1K super troopers that we can burn yeah, their eyebrows off with, right? right? Spotlights. So, um, so I'm on the lighting desk, and he's like, normally he'll isolate one person, and we'll, he'll just chase the, have the entire crowd, point chanting at him, and him in, yeah, chanting, chanting and vulgar chants, and chase him away. This particular night, he spots an entire section behind me that's just not refusing to stand. He's incensed. He starts in berating them. What's wrong with you? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, you know, what's the matter? You got no legs. Or, what he doesn't see is me stand, me going like this. Cut, like that. Cut. Give him the cut sign. Finally, he gives up. He finishes the song. Comes back. I go. I run to the dressing room. He says, "What was wrong with those people behind you?" I said, "Idiot! That was the cripple section." It was handicapped. It was hand. So all the yeah. people in wheelchairs yeah. said, "Stand yeah. up! What are you crippled?" All right. <laughs> so that happened in Europe too once. Yes. The next day on the drum riser, name of the city. Diagram of the venue, big X where the handicap section is. Never made the same mistake twice. <laughs> uh, just, just, just very, very funny stuff. And you, you go back and you think, and it, it is just really was Spinal Tap moments. No, there were a lot of them. Well, oh. that that in store, the in store and Spinal Tap. If you've never seen the movie, it's a it's a satire of a fictional heavy metal band, and. The first time I saw it, at least, it's a hysterical movie, but it was, I, I couldn't even laugh because I kept thinking, how did they know? How did they figure this out? Because some of the most ridiculous things are actually so true. And there's a scene in it where the band is doing an in-store and nobody shows up and Paul Schaefer is the, is the field rep and he turns around and goes, just kick, kick me in the ass, kick me hard, kick me, it's my fault, it's my <laughs> fault. We had one of those in London, no yes. less. In London, it was, it was. Wow, they had forgot to publicize it. Nobody was there. 
um, the people working there, of course it was a major city, they didn't like our kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just just amazing. You know what? I want to go to one one another thing here yeah. that actually happened. Uh, I don't know if you remember this well. Do you remember when we uh, when D got arrested in, in Lub? Do in, I remember Buck, Lub, Texas? Mm-mm, Buck, yes, Buck, Texas, and how every city after that warned us about the sheriff in El Paso. Do you remember what happened when we got there? Didn't we, is that the you, one where the daughter you, was at the drum riser or the son was at the drum riser? No, no, hold on, you're going, yeah, you're right, but he's going a little further. Do you remember that um, you and D and JJ suggested that I go to the production meeting as a member of the band with you? Yeah, that's right. It's you at know, security meeting with exactly, me. Exactly. Yes, I took you with me. Exactly. Yeah. So. Um, so you and I, we go down to the to, yeah. to, the, to the venue. It's we knew this one El was going to be nasty. Texas, yeah. you know, every city before we got there for a week and a half, because all the two press, weeks, yeah. always warned us about the sheriff in El Paso, Texas. Because it was a very he vulgar was, act. It would, yeah. He was, he was going to, he was, was gunning for us. Guy, yep. He was going to. We, you do not, you want to cancel that show. Yeah. You do not want to go to El Paso. <laughs> Day of the show, we show up the night before. There was a uh, uh, a, um, a, prayer a rodeo meeting. there. Oh, that's right. There was, there was a, a rodeo. In the cone, so it smelled like cow dung everywhere, <laughs> and it was a dust bowl, an absolute oh, dust bowl. Man, that was so uh, we're standing there, and the the uh, the promoter is there, the arena, the head of security in the arena, and we're waiting for the sheriff's department to show yeah, up. Yeah, normally I'll you have never, a security meeting before right, every arena show. Right. It's just you, the house security, and, and representative yeah, yeah. The cops. And but it's, they it's asked that routine, I go. Very routine. They asked that I this go because, and again, I changed my look by tying yep. my hair back and putting on a, a yep. have a red like look about myself. Gotcha. What's that? Gotcha. Exactly. Yeah, he, he would become our bus driver when the situation. Yeah, yeah exactly. Or so our security guard. We're standing there now. All these arenas have these huge garage doors where they drive tractor trailers through. And we're standing there, and the promoter's standing there, and everybody's standing there, and the promoter goes, all right, the sheriff's coming here. And here comes the seven police cars. Right? Oh, the, ba- the motorcade, right. yes. The motorcade, black and white, but the, the sheriff was driving an unmarked car, like yeah. a tan-colored car or something. Pull up, dust here. everywhere. This guy gets out of the car. He's got to be seven feet tall. <laughs> I mean, he, he's got, he looks like he was chiseled out of stone. He puts on the 10-gallon hat, has the big star in the front. They're wearing their guns like cowboys, right? Tan pants, cowboy boots. He's got the, he's not wearing a uniform. He's wearing a white shirt, bolo tie, mirrored sunglasses. This guy looks like he will tear you to pieces just because you're standing there. No better. Walks past us. Ramona says, hello, sheriff. He says nothing. He's chewing a piece of field grass. Remember that? (laughs) We go into this room, this meeting room, right inside the door there. We all walk in there. He comes in, walks past us, sits down in a chair, puts his feet on the table. They got to be size 17 (laughs) boots, cowboy boots, right? And Joe gets up and starts talking. Do you remember what he did? No. Okay. So Joe gets up and starts going fast. Ba 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 ba. Because Joe was a fast businessman and things. Happen. And I'm running. So and I'm trying the, to run like a normal sheriff, meeting, which is the sheriff now lets his his chair drop. Right. He takes his hat off, puts it on the table, and he goes, "Shut the bleep up." <laughs> and Joe goes, "But but I'm not going to say it again. Shut up." We're like quiet. You could hear pin drop in the room. We didn't know what he was going to do and left. He goes. I've heard about y'all. I don't particularly like this, but I'll tell you what. My son is a big fan of your band, and he's a, he wants to be a drummer. So if you let my son, and I can't imitate the accent, so if you let my son sit behind your drummer, I don't give a bleep what y'all do. Gets up, and he walks out. And that was the rough, tough sheriff yeah. of El Paso. So if you ever get to see anything, if there ever was any bootleg videos of, of it, show. there was a 12-year-old You'll boy sitting behind A.J. Pirro the whole time, <laughs> sitting like three feet behind him, watching a, him drunk and stuff <laughs> like having that. The time and of his having life. the time of his life. You saw a big arena show, and uh-huh. here's this kid on stage. with And a great kid. He great was a kid. great kid. Yeah, he was a nice kid. And, and uh, the, the, the sheriff's deputies were great. They were all nice. and But we were warned about this sheriff. <laughs> And That's all we heard for it a week. Went, it was nothing. I mean, again, because his kid liked us, I could see it, it going would, really It could have gone the other way. It could have gone, gone really, really bad. But I remember when he told you to shut the bleep up. 
just shut up. See, that one doesn't say that because a lot of people said that. Yeah, but he that. was serious. <laughs> you know, he was serious, man. So, you know, that was great stuff. But um, a couple other things. The, 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 sh- the sheriff of El Paso. But, again, another story which you could probably elaborate on because I think you saw it from the, the crowd side. Uh, of course, uh, Joe and I and, and uh, quite a few of us around have a very good friend named Ann. Yes. Ann's been a friend of mine since the... the Club like late 70s, you yeah. know, I think 79, 80. Um, still a very, very dear friend of mine. Uh, she, she might even be watching. Actually, she's not. She's at the Kiss show tonight. Yeah, in thanks, the garden. Man. Right, thanks, Ann. Thanks for abandoning us. Yeah. In any case, there was a legendary night at a club called Detroit. <laughs> you know where I'm going? I think so, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and being a good friend of ours, also someone who watched the band from the audience right in the front row, we're in between songs, D's rapping. I drink some orange juice of water, and I don't spit it at her, but I spit it in the area between the stage and a barricade that we had. Okay, are you familiar with this? Laura, okay, you're gonna love this. So she takes some sort of mixed drink and throws it at me and just hits me. I'm soaked in sweat anyway, but hits me with some sort of mixed drink. The ice cubes go everywhere, hits it. So like, now there's, how many people in Detroit when it's packed? Um, 13, 1400. 13, 1400s. It's packed. 12 to 13. So what do I do? I reach down for her. She pushes back. The audience pushes her forward. And she goes, no. I grab her arms. All right. She weighed 90 pounds wet. Pick her up. Put her on the stage. Right. And she's like, yeah. And she doesn't see me. I walk over to where my equipment is. I grab a half a gallon of Tropicana orange juice. And as she's doing this, I pour it on her head. Okay? Shake it up. That's a half a gallon of orange juice on her and on the stage. And as she's like, "Ah!" she's wearing a white shirt with nothing on underneath it, and you can see everything. As she's panicked and horrified, I now go over and get another half gallon, (laughs) shake it up, as she's like, ah! Dump it on her. Now she's truly soaked. There is orange juice everywhere on the stage, right? Everywhere. And then, as she's panicking, I just take her and give her a push. <laughs> okay? And I'm, I'm the glad that the audience caught her, yeah. right? And she just went to the back of the room. I don't know what happened to her at that particular point. But the one thing I will say, and Not she didn't talk to me for X amount of months, actually days, but. Charlie Barreca, our sound man at the time, he got so mad at her. <laughs> mad at her, okay? Are you because, in show business? Because all of the cables that our crew would run were soaked in orange juice yeah. and sticky. <laughs> so as they're putting them away, they have to wipe down each you wrap, cable. You wrap a cable around you your arm like cables, this. Right. Yeah. So they are just cleaning. And there's snakes, cables it. everywhere. And our, for our the cables, lights, for the, they're oh, in yeah. these dumps five nights a week anyway exactly. to begin with. Yeah. They, extra, extra schmutz is not their idea so at that time. So they had to clean every cable off. It took them hours. To, and he knew her. And he blamed it on her. It was great. Never said a word to him. Of course, I'm in the band. What right. do you do to me? So he blamed it on her. Well, so and was Charlie. But oh, yeah. Charlie was a tough character to deal with back then. Speaking especially. of liquids on the stage, um, as I don't know how well we established it early on, but there was an unusual uh, connection. There were several unusual connections between the dictators and Twisted. You're the most obvious one. Right. There's uh, Richie Teeter. Richie Teeter, who right. replaced Tony Petra for a short time as a favorite us, also played in both bands. There's actually a third person. Yeah. Mel Anderson, Mel Twisted's Anderson. first drummer, as Mel Starr, right. was the Dictator's last drummer on their first incarnation. There was always a close connection between the two bands. And period, one night Ross came out and jammed with us at Hammerheads. At Hammerheads. And then another night, Handsome Dick came out to visit. The lead singer of the Dictators, Handsome Dick Manitoba. Google it, folks. You'd be worth it. Okay. So, uh, one night he is out there. It's in Long Island. And unbeknownst to Handsome Dick, there was a Dictator song, Next Big Thing, that Marx had sort of rudimentarily taught the band yeah. that we would just sort of fool around with and sound check, and I'd come up and sing. And occasionally, on weird nights, if we're doing a third set, Dee never played the third set because he was resting. Usually JJ would just come out and sing. For a while, Elmo, our light man, came out and told jokes. Oh and then one night, one night he got booed and he never wanted to go out again. So I would <laughs> go out and do a song. So I would go out and do this Dictator song. So Richard's there, and we ask, you know, 
you want to do the next big thing tonight? He says, what do you mean? He says, well, Joe used it. He says, I don't want to take it. He says, well, I said, we'll do it as a duet, right? So the band goes to the next big thing, or, or their version of it, which at that point really hadn't been worked out as a full arrangement. Right. It's really just the riff and a bunch oh, of a, a bunch well. of cra- lunacy. And I come out, I push him out first, and our crowd, which is familiar, they know the song. Oh, good, Joe's going to come out. They see me, but then they see me push this little four, five foot, eight inch afro out there with a big gut. Uh, who is this guy? And he starts singing, and I'm just kind of looking there smirking. Then I do the second verse, and all is right with the world. Then he starts singing again, and then we get to the guitar solo, which is traditionally where I would just kind of do something stupid. And as the guitar solo starts, Handsome Dick is called Handsome Dick because he modeled himself on a professional wrestler. So he had a lame thing, and, it, and it, he would talk to the audience the way the way Freddie Blassie would talk to an audience. So, uh, nobody you know, knows who Freddie yeah, Blassie is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not most people would yeah, know. But, but uh, yes. the way an old time heel wrestler right. would talk right. to the audience, right. you know, I just got back from me, I beat Dick the Bruiser, you know, that kind of loud mouth. So I real okay, wrestler, you want to wrestle? I come up behind. Him and I hit him with a flying elbow. This is all while JJ's doing a solo. Then I think of my slam him onto the ground. I'm not really hitting him hard, and I and I do a knee drop on him, which I partly pull, but I think I probably didn't pull it. I do a, I do a couple more elbow drops, and he's starting to look a little uncomfortable. So I back off and. Guitar solo is going on, and now he gets up and he starts stumbling. The dressing room is all the way off. It's about 30 feet off stage left, and he's trying desperately to get there. I can see, and he's wobbling, and he's cross-sided, and I know he's been drinking heavily, and I didn't realize he had done some other things before he got there. This before he got clean and sober, and I realize he's really messed up, and one of those knee drops has really hit something, and he just wants so badly to get to the dressing room. And I can see D is is watching this just because it's hilarious. Because you know why? Who, why? Who is this guy? Joey's beating up on stage. It should be why is this person beating up handsome Dick? But in our world, it's who is this guy that Joe's beating up for no reason? <laughs> um, and as he almost makes it to the dressing room door, he launches. The the the, 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 the thing that comes to mind is the phrase "throw up." It's really, it's not accurate. People don't ever throw up. What they do is, they usually throw down. Occasionally, if they're very sick, they may throw out. No one ever throws up. Or so I thought. (laughs) That night, I witnessed a man throw up. He dropped to his knees, threw his head back, and it was as if somebody had opened a fire hydrant. It just came came flying out out. and splashed against the back. D had to close the door because he only got. And the rest of the band is virtually stopped laughing and stuff. They're all watching. JJ's standing out on the the monitor rise, like like this, paying no attention, wondering why the band has fallen apart behind him. But, you know, he'll save it. He'll stay out there. Everybody else is, is. Stop dead laughing. He gets up, crying, takes two more steps, drops again, and boom! These single, I mean, I've often said that, that comedy is, you know, is just the, the misery of others. You know, the funniest thing in the world is somebody else stepping on a rake. But this was, this proved it to me. It is the single funniest thing I've ever seen. Is this man in such deep distress and trauma, just fluid coming out of him at a pressure level that would burst a fire hose. Hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. I'm sorry, where were we? <laughs> that's where we were. Okay. That, that's where we were. Okay. A couple but of, I digress. I got, a, okay. I got, a, I got a, a, a little bit more later model story of Joe. Um, of course, um, for Jody, duct tape and car on fire, Staten Island. What's that? Oh, the duct tape. Do you want the duct tape story? The duct. Ah, the oh, that duct was tape in a movie, story. Oh, yeah, that was in the movie, the, wasn't it? What's that? That was, was in the movie. movie. Yeah, it was, yeah, in, it was movie. in the movie. The the car on fire. What's the car on fire story? I don't know. Okay, I don't know either. Well, let me get to this story. Um, of course, Joe will know exactly you know, what I'm talking about in a second. Keeping things running smoothly. Um, D. Snyder and I, we do D. Snyder's ride every year. Yes. Um, and uh, I do it most great, years with you as well. It's a great run. Let me see this, what she's got coming up. Have to excuse our producer is getting the shot here. Okay. 
Okay, so. Which one is this? Levelo, the car went on fire when we got to the club, and Joe asked for duct tape to fix it so we could drive home after the gig. Was that a broken oh, hose? Oh, wait a minute. Was that the hose we fixed? Oh. It was steam. It wasn't Oh, I'd fire. forgotten about this one. It was It was steam. It wasn't smoke. No, there was an actual fire. Was there? What car? Your car? The uh, Keybird? One of my cars. I think it was the Sunbird. The Sunbird? The old Sunbird. might have been the Peugeot, even. <laughs> I'd have, to, anyway, I'd have to remember let me, that one. Let me just tell this story. Yeah, please. So, um, of course, we D and I do the motorcycle runs, and um, Dee's turned out to be a very good rider. And uh, one year, AJ had a motorcycle run. I remember. Staten I was Island. there for it. Yeah, I know you were there for it. <laughs> so, a very good friend of mine, um, now, <laughs> oh, retired, I know what you, oh. now retired from oh. the state police, is a motorcycle state trooper. Oh, you're going to go okay. there, huh? Yeah, I'm going to go there. Oh, Because to this day, he still talks about it. So, um, he's off duty. He's still working now, but he's he's on his personal motorcycle. And and myself and Joe and 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 Howie Thomas, I knew I wasn't uh, D. Get Snyder, D. Snyder, and some other people that we do charities outside. with. There's about six or seven of us ride to Staten Island from Long Island. Joe comes from Manhattan, so we didn't ride with him. We meet AJ Perot. We meet all the bikers there, and you're going for a motorcycle run around Staten Island, all the big roadways on Staten Island, and the police are are leading it and everything. And it's it's only going to be about 35, 40 miles an hour, and and he's got to have a, a you know a, a probably five or six hundred motorcycles. Yeah, it was it would end up being a lot big. slower. He, right, he vapor locked. Yeah, I remember. And we also jammed on stage with other bands. Yeah. So we're up front. AJ's in front with another guy who, who arranged it, and then D and I are the second row, and there's a few other charitable people there. And I want to say that about the eighth or tenth row back, yeah, I'm in the front Howard pack, yeah. Thomas, yeah. and next to him, this cop. Now, how is, how is, Howard Thomas is, a, is a, a state trooper, but he's on his personal motorcycle. And next to him on the right <laughs> is Joe on your Kawasaki. I was on my little baby, my baby ninja, yeah. Right, baby ninja that's held the together. Only, the only non cruiser right. in the entire field. Right, right, right. <laughs> Right, right. But I'm the guy. On the, I'm the guy on the right. This burner. is only the beginning. That's, That's okay. Nothing. That's two okay. wheels. Two wheels and an two, engine. Yeah, two wheels. Two count. wheels and an engine. Yep, it counts. It counts. Okay? Yes. So it's also quite beat up. Yes. It's duct tape. As are all, as are all my bikes. Right. All, all his my bikes. Because he, he parks in the city. Gets I leave knocked on the street. Over. The street. They rats. get knocked over. So everything's got duct tape on it. Everything's got bungee cords right. holding it together. So again, it's still not bad. Right. Well, what happens is we get going. Okay, and Joe, being Joe, because people don't like we do, Joe decides in the middle of the ride, after like five minutes in, that not only is his cell phone ringing, and he's got it like this, while he's on the cell phone, he's lighting a cigarette and smoking a cigarette. So we're all in perfect line. Perfect. 35 miles an hour, nobody's moving, it's side by side, police close the roads, they're escorting us, and Joe is like this, <laughs> slowing down, speeding up, cutting off Howie and and it goes for the you whole ride. You gotta understand. Ride. I don't. I ride every day, almost 365. Only if there's only if there's ice will I not. Ride. I ride every day, but I never ride in tandem the way most people do. I'm not used to it. And I ride the way most people drive. I'm on my phone. I'm lighting a cigarette. I'm thinking about what I have to do when I get there. I'm not. I'm not the safest rider in the world. But no kidding. But no, 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 but, no, wait, 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 no, no. I ride in it, Manhattan. It was, which which means I know six ways to get out of every potential danger there is. I can t I can turn the bike when I use my hands three different ways, but it doesn't look particularly good, and it's certainly not so the way they teach you in the safety class. Trooper Howard Thomas, being the professional that he is, <laughs> holds his line. <laughs> right. Okay, you don't. I almost break wiped the line. him out a couple times. A couple. I'm watching. I'm looking. <laughs> Only at my when mirror. the phone rang. That yeah, was it. Yeah, looking in my mirror and. Hey, I had a phone call. There was <laughs> times that you practically brushed pegs with him because you. I'm you're used slow. to having. Away into myself. You're slowing down, you're speeding up, you're, you're leaning left and right, and we're just going straight, nice and smooth. So we get through this whole ride and how he deals with it, <laughs> and we get back at the end, and we're we're all dismounting our bikes, and he comes walking over to me and he goes, "Who the hell is that guy? <laughs> Who the hell is that guy?" And I said, "Well, that's Joe Gerber, <laughs> Joe Gerber, you know, friend of a twisted right? sister, or a tour manager, and a good friend." And he goes. If I was on job, if I was on duty, <laughs> the guy would be arrested. 
Okay, he almost wrecked everybody around him. Okay, <laughs> matter of fact, he almost wrecked himself. A he's couple of times exaggerating. Because he's crossing. He's crossing the double yellow line I, by mistake. I was on the right. oncoming truck. On he right. blew, please. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah. Now he's I'm riding, the line. I'm watching now in my mirror, and he's he's now wandering to the right with a solid white line would be the fog line is, and he's hitting potholes and 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 I just and he didn't go down once, but he's wobbling and he's but he's like this. He's, he's got. I'm got other things neck, going on. I did. I did actually. I did actually. And, and he, I pulled the pretzel was, out of my pocket at one yeah, point. And started yeah, eating started the pretzel. A pretzel. I did do that because I was. I was hungry. It was taking forever, man. So Joe, Joe, when D and I do the ride here on Long Island every year, um, you know, Joe shows up most of the time, and how it happens to be there, you know, even though he's retired now, but he rode as a as a state trooper in right. front of us. He was the lead, one of the lead motorcycles. He would always see Joe and go, "He's not riding with us. He's not. Riding with us. He's not <laughs> I got a ticket book. I got handcuffs. He's getting arrested. He's not riding with us." So to this. Day he definitely <laughs> to this has day he still has no respect. No respect whatsoever. I hope he realizes. Okay. I, as AJ once put, here, I can ride here anything. We, here with we two go. Wheels. Here we here we go. This is what I'm putting on the spot. Oh, it's a lightning round here. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay, so Joe first starts working with Twisted Sister in I think '79. '79. '79. Joe and uh, we become good friends. Good friends. Quickly. Good you know, friends. Joe's a great guy. He is st- certainly a very close friend of mine. Um. I don't know, sometime it's still cool out. I want to say it's late winter, early spring. Okay. And Joe says to me, calls me during the day, he goes, Man, why don't you spend the rest of the weekend, the Sunday in, in the city with me? Uh-huh. You know, stay over. Oh, right, because we had like a Jersey show and then we were going right, to open right, the Jersey right. to follow So week. I arranged yeah. for D to, you know, get a ride home because right, right. they usually went with me. I know this and uh, all we, we all drive right. into the city. I find I'm driving my big Oldsmobile. Right. Remember that? The big tank. Yeah, the Flintstone Mobile. Right, the Flintstone Mobile. It was called the Flintstone Mobile because it had a hole in the floorboard and you could go right, blah, 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 and the water would come splashing yes, up at us. But in any case, um, so we show up at your apartment, right? And I got my two guitars in the truck. I had just started with the band. Right, you just started with the band. So it's going to be a beautiful early spring day in the city. It was actually, it was autumn. I'm pretty sure it was autumn. No, it was, it was early. It okay. Was, it was spring. Right. Yeah, I remember that was spring. Okay. So, um, you know, here we'll sleep a few hours. We'll get breakfast. We'll go out for the day. Oh, yeah. You know, we'll show you around the neighborhood. Joe, where Joe lives, is beautiful. And so we grab my guitars. I grab my my, my luggage, a little bit of luggage, like a backpack and, and a duffel bag, and and up we go. We go into Joe's house. We go up. We open. He opens the door of his apartment. That's right. I was already there. You you had come. Yeah, with right, yeah. right, right. So we walk inside. I put my guitars down and my duffel bag. I drop everything real quick. Never been to can't his apartment you, before. Can't you tell him this. Right. Right? It's a big apartment. So there is, I hear, a vacuum cleaner going. Now you remember, it's now probably someplace between 6 and 7 in the morning. 536. Yeah, no, it was, it was yeah, the you, sun was that's already right. coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, All right? We, we drove about an On hour. On a Sunday morning, yeah. yeah. Sunday morning. So I hear oh, a vacuum cleaner going, story. figuring... I don't know if Joe has a girlfriend, a boyfriend. An it, <laughs> Nobody really knows. Tran- I'm playing a trans, a trans, a trans yeah, test. I have no I, I idea give people because on that, we on don't a, know what Joe on does. A balls their feet. So, yeah. so I'm As standing there, right? And a girl, a, not a young girl, but probably in the late 20s. Late I mean, I'm 20s, talking about a late kid. 20s, late, 20s. late 20s, close to 30. I'm My wearing, height. Now I'm wearing fry boots, so I'm six foot three and a half. She's wearing pumps, though. What's She's that? wearing spike heels. Right. She's as tall as I am. Gorgeous, dressed in lingerie, with everything hanging out, and I'm like, and I go like this, and he goes, "Don't say a word." <laughs> All right, she walks past me and she starts dusting the furniture. You know, cleaning lemon pledge and cleaning. Joe had a living room that he had this esoteric hi fi in that was spotless. Okay, and now I know how why it was spotless. This girl is cleaning everything, right? So here comes the vacuum cleaner. There's another one. Another one, dressed the same way, <laughs> vacuuming the floors. The sister Annabelle. Dusting, and and the carpet, the little throw rugs that he has there, right? And so I mean, he goes, <laughs> and he goes to me. Get your hand off the microphone. You're pissing Stephen off. Sorry. So I'm he goes. Joe now goes to me. He he doesn't say it loud. He gets in my ear and he goes, "Don't talk to them. <laughs> don't give them any attention. Don't say anything and don't ask me anything. Just ignore them." I'm like, 
looking at statuesque, gorgeous models in lingerie, and I'm not supposed to notice them, right? So I, I'm, I, what? So as I walk towards the kitchen, there's another one in there doing the dishes. Wait now. Wait. Another one, a third one doing the dishes, and he goes. Just ignore them. Just go with it, man. Just go with it. Don't say anything to them. Don't talk Act to like them. Act like it's normal. So I'm like, okay, all right. I, I, I'll follow. I don't know Joe well. I have no idea if there's... That's what's really funny, man. So I go in there, and I, I get a glass of water, and he says to me, it's all good. I'm going to show you to your, the bedroom you can use at the end of the hall. It has a private bathroom. And, and we walk down there, and I go in there, and, I, and, and he closes the door. And, I, okay, you know, I'm like, I have no clue what What's going to go on or anything like that? Well, with me, nothing. Nothing. So I run inside these extra bathroom. I take a shower because you smell like cigarette smoke in those days, remember? Hair stunk. Your clothing stunk. Take everything off. Take a shower. Get into a nice clean bed and sleep. You know, figure I'll wake up whenever I wake up. So I wake up, put some sweats on. Place is quiet. Quiet. Joe has a nice big apartment. It's beautiful. Quiet. So I'm like, I'm thirsty. I'm going to go get something to drink. So as I walk towards the kitchen, that's when the story is going to end. Because okay. I'm not going to tell him what okay. I saw. Okay. That, that's a bit okay. private. That is, okay. So, so, no, no, no. It, it, a little, little add to the story, though. But so later that day, we leave the house. I don't know where they are. I don't know if they left. I don't know if they're still there. But later, probably I want to say it was about 12, 1 o'clock, okay. you say to me, let's go grab a bite to eat. I know a great place in the neighborhood we can walk to. And you leave the car exactly where it is. And we do. We walk down to some luncheonette that was incredible, I think, close, closer to Broadway. Uh, yeah, it would have been, would have been, uh, oh, it was, would have been a Broadway restaurant. Yeah, yeah. great. We had eggs and everything. We sat there and we were walking around the neighborhood. And, and you're actually seeing people you know and saying right. hello okay. to them. <clears throat> and, and so we stopped at a corner. I said, Joe. What the hell was that all about? <laughs> and he goes, don't ask. Just don't ask. Don't ask. Don't, don't ask. Please don't ask. <laughs> so I go to your house like six months later, and there's three more. <laughs> different ones. Better looking than the first group. And it's killing me. Because like, we're at the clubs playing around with little girls. You know, like 18, 20, 22. These are like... They're women. They're wi oh, man. Do you want to talk about well-developed? They're women. They're women. Do you still have the tapes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got them to say yes. I got them to say yes. You one of them I made them. for... One because of them, because I, in Joe's room, you got to understand, we're all used to today's technology where you can make amazing home videos with your cell phone, okay? In Joe's room, there was two RCA VHS camcorder oh cameras set up on these just massive... Really, just two. Just one on a tripod. Two, That's two on a tripod. One on a tripod. Two. He's, he's BSing you. A handheld. Two. But yeah, but it was on a tripod. Tri there was one two. Two of these. Uh, back then, they were like four grand You're each, You're getting right? the wrong idea. I was not a pornographer. There were How a lot of money. There were a lot of money, right? So, I was not a pornographer. So, I just like to remember things. That's so, all. No, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Don't give me the so, wrong idea. So the second I just want time, to remember things. Now we're in, when now we're, for like now when I'm old. Okay? Now we're, we're definitely in the summer. Now we're definitely in the summer. It's hot out. Joe says, hey, come on, stay again, you know, for Sunday. <laughs> okay, no problem. Didn't think twice about it again. Didn't think about the first time. Um, and we actually had a couple of girls we brought back to your house. That's right, yes. Right? Walk in, there's three more in there <laughs> doing, doing the place up. And I'm like, what am I missing here? Attitude, what, baby. What, what can I what, tell you? What am I missing here? I'm like, do you still have the tapes? Oh, yeah. One of them, I, 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 there was a tape. One time we were in a club. I don't think we were playing. We went up as a favor to Kevin Brenner. To go help a, uh, he was. I think he was bringing Joe Savage into the. Circuit. Oh yes, we did go. It was this Vegas act that he was trying to break in, and he wanted a representative from each of the big bands. So I corralled you. Yeah, I went. And with we you. went up there, and we ran into these two girls, um, who I won't use the names of. <coughs> Very I attractive. Remember. I don't remember. Two girls that we knew. That we that yeah, we knew. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one of whom thought you were very cute. So we decided we're going to go home. I'm cute. We, we decided we're going to go, because I was seeing the other one at the time. Right. So we decided, well, the four of us are going to go back to my place. And then at the very last minute, you remembered that you had something to do and couldn't do it. So I said, well, what am I going to do? And you said, take both of them and film it for me. 
So you did. that's what I did. Yes, you did. Yes, I did. Yes, you did film it for me. And it's, it's you it, did. It, it awaits you. But yes. it's still, it's still. I've never forgotten. Now, how many trios did you have? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. I'm not sure I want to have this conversation on, <laughs> on the air. <laughs> it's but you know what? As you as you as you see and go through a lot he, of these, he, he like, even let me tell the you, most embarrassing every, stuff. Everybody, oh, I do remember a lot of it. <laughs> when we could get to it in a minute, but I'll as we go, camera. as you as you as you go through life, and and most of my friends are not entertainers and musicians. They they're mechanics and truck drivers and attorneys. I was a hi-fi salesman. Yeah, you were a hi-fi salesman, but you don't count in this one. <laughs> <laughs> they live vicariously through me. They want to hear the stories and everything that went on backstage and tour buses and hotel rooms. But let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm a rock star, and I lived vicariously through him. And I was a hot by salesman. I mean, you walk into his house, and, and this is what I saw. Now, I witnessed this three times with three different sets of women in his house. <laughs> what about me? <laughs> well, um, Mark, listen, I got nothing on Mark, is all I can say. This man. No, I don't know about that. Listen, he no, is no, a rock star. No, 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 but I and, and I'm going to interrupt him because to this day, nobody in the band ever witnessed this at his house. I was well, nobody ever came to the house. Right, right. Well, D did a couple of times. A couple of times. Stay yeah, with he you, did, JJ, he, 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 he did Jay over. never did. Jay lived up the block. Right, he know? lived like he lived the 15 he, blocks yeah. north of you. But but D came over a couple. He came times, over a couple times, and those people weren't there when he was there. No, for, interestingly enough, they weren't. They were never there when he. Was, so when I would tell him about sure it, and I would get you know we would jump in the next next time I'd see D would be during the week for the first game. He knew about it. Though, right. He had heard right. So before he knew about it, he'd get in the car with me. I go, D, you got to see what I witnessed at Joe. Joe's house, you know, and he and he would, he was surprised. Joe, like, Joe, little little gay Joe with the two tube socks, and really Joe, yeah, 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 with the corkies, right. <laughs> so, yeah, that that's that's what went on, and I obviously I can't say too much. But about all that. that did was it gave me a certain amount of cred to hang around with real rock stars. Cred, which, which Mark was, and who lived it. These girls I, were, were like beyond Playboy models. They were pretty. They were pretty spectacular. Spectacular. You're talking about genetic perfection. Uh, you may be exaggerating. No, yeah. I, they were pretty amazing. They, were, they didn't suck. I, I mean, I mean visu <laughs> visually, visually, they didn't visually, suck. Visually, yeah. they didn't I suck. Didn't suck. <laughs> so it's coming out finally that, that there was it. Visually, they, 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 they were, they were, here, here they were not I'm hard gonna, on the ice. I'm going to interview Joe. <laughs> were they part of an escort service? No. Well, interestingly enough, I think... Oh, a here we go. He's going to go around a, it. No, a couple of them. Here's the deal. The first one you ever met was Amanda. Yes. She was she wanted to be my girlfriend. But how come I couldn't talk to them? Well, because first of all, they spoke in this New Orleans accent that I had trouble understanding. Oh, so they so definitely. I didn't know that. Now you're giving me a place where they're from. Oh yeah, they're from New Orleans. Almost all of them. All of them? Well, no. Well, wait a second, wait. Joe Gerber's New Orleans connection. <laughs> Here's the thing. I met this. I knew. That? I, I know. <laughs> oh, but, but I met. Amanda and Donna was another one, one night, and we had a really good time, and Amanda sort of kind of fell in love with me. And Amanda, What's not to love? And Amanda, Amanda's an interesting person because Amanda was like sort of the mayor of New Orleans, you know, uh, you're the social mayor, like she knew everybody. Oh, everybody okay. loved I was say, her. You have the you mayor saw, of New Orleans she, walking around a lingerie, cleaning no, your not, apartment. Not the actual mayor, not, not you know, <laughs> no, not Mary Landrew. Oh, yes, I got you. She, you know, the social mayor. Everybody knew her. She could. She dominated a room for some reason. She, yeah, she certainly dominated a room. For some reason, she thought the little Hebrew was cute, right? So <laughs> she had a thing for me. And at the time, I am I'm, I'm actually going to tell all you dudes a secret out there that if you can harness it. If this is the kind of thing that interests you, it's very useful information. At the time I met Amanda, I was in love with somebody else. As a result, as much fun as Amanda was to hang out with, or Amanda and Donna the first night, or Amanda and Annabelle and Raynell the second <laughs> night, or as, as much fun as it was, and don't get me wrong, I, this is not a complaint. It, and it was this late, it was 79, so you know, the worst thing you could get, you could fix with a shot of penicillin. Um, as much fun as it was, I was never emotionally attached to her because I was in love with somebody else. She was not used to that. She was used to having what she wanted. Who, when who was she, the other one? Pardon? Who was the other one that the you other were in love one? with? Oh, you remember Pat? 
from New Jersey? Yeah. No. Yeah, I was in love with Pat at the time. So you met her. <laughs> Dee knows her. Wait a minute, she was at she was at the, she came with me to Adventure End. I don't remember, I'm yeah, sorry. I, I remember. She's very pretty. She's not as pretty as three New Orleans women, but you know, who is? You know, this is, I, I I'm telling you that the was, point was I was in love that with somebody was genetic else. Genetic perfection. Point was I was in love with somebody else. Amanda, I think, my best guess, because here's she would travel a lot, she had business in New Orleans. So whenever she would leave, she always made sure that I was not by myself because she was insanely jealous. And it was her nightmare that I would be with somebody else. So she figures, well, I'm going to be with somebody else anyway. I'd rather they be my friends. So I would get woken up in the middle of the night by girls dressed like that with overcoats on with little maps on how to get to my bedroom. You know? This is not a joke. This because is how this happened? This is how this happened. I wouldn't even know they'd be there. How many nights since 1979 I've been looking for the answer to that? This is, well, you never asked. I did ask. No, you, you never always, asked. Yes, I did. And you said, don't ask. No, I'm I I'm not didn't. talking about no, it. Yes, you did. I, 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 no, I'd I'm share sorry. everything you with did. you. Come no, on. No, you did. That was the only friend. thing you said, don't ask. You haven't asked. I don't remember you asking. I asked. I, at the time, at the time, I didn't really want to explain this in front of them. Come Look. over and see this and go, you see them walking around, you go, what's this? Well, the funny thing is there was lots of little in-jokes. So and this, I hate telling this because this is self-aggrandizing, but I, it got to the point where I had to number them because I couldn't remember all their names. Um, and so they were referred to as wench number and then followed by a number. Wench number. We used the word wench because they started early on, Donna, one of the girls who was with her the first night, was really I'm dying over here. <laughs> was really drunk and said something bizarre like did anybody remember the movie Mandingo? Yes, of course. With Ken, Ken Norton. Norton. Yes. Yeah, Ken Norton. Ken Norton plays a uh, I, I I've never seen it. I think he you plays a seen it? I think he plays a slave who is used to service white women. Yeah. Is basically the concept of it. And I heard for the first time, but not the last, I heard the phrase pleasure me Mandingo. So all of a sudden <laughs> All of a sudden, and again, this is not the kind of story I like to tell because usually the ones I have to tell are about how stupid I am because I'm really stupid. And this one's kind of self-aggrandizing. But I got to tell you, it's kind of adorable. When Amanda used to call me her little baby Mandingo, which I thought was adorable. <laughs> and then she would pet me on the head. But, because um, that's the way she talked. My, my little baby Mandingo. I could go so far so, with this right um, now, and I'm not going to say anyway, anything. I don't know so much as an interview now, so much as a therapy session. But, um, I digress. Point being, point being is that because she was in love with me and it was unrequited, she did things that she wouldn't have done for anyone else in a desire to get me to um, requite her feelings for me. And it speaks to the nature of male-female relationships very often being about power. And one person holding it and the other person not. And that's as serious I'm, as I'm going to get for this interview. But if you read between the lines on that, gentlemen and ladies, you can learn a lot. Okay? Um, you learn that Joe has the power to get three beautiful women dressed in lingerie to clean his apartment and make pornos with him. That's what you learned from well, us. Well, I, 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 I didn't make very many pornos. Mo mostly we just hung out. The best was, I will say, the, my favorite you, you, thing, I, he, he, well, my favorite thing yeah, the whole time, wait, wait you're going to like this, you're going to like this. Hung out. They played Twisted. Yeah, they played Twisted <laughs> naked. <laughs> naked. Yeah, they hung out. The right? best. Yeah, right? I will tell you. Yeah, the, yeah. you should have heard it. I slept down the hall <laughs> and the sound effects were unbelievable. My favorite, my favorite recollection of that time is one night we decided, feeling a little hungry, in those days, you know, now nobody goes to Chinese restaurants anymore, but in those days, there was a local Chinese restaurant, sit down, very nice, and we're gonna go to my local Chinese restaurant, I'm hungry. <laughs> they were cleaning, which meant they were wearing their gold lame uh, cat suits with, with little cat ears and dog collars. I saw them. And, and, and pumps and spike heels. And I said, okay, well, why don't you guys get dressed? I said, no, we'll go like that. I said, okay. And they said, wait a minute. And they went, and they went to Amanda's suitcase, and they came out, and they had three dog leashes. And they each hooked up the leash to the car, and they handed me, they handed me the leashes, and I walked them up Broadway into Hunan Taste on Saturday night in 1979 or 80, when the, the average age of the crowd in that restaurant was deceased, okay? This is my neighborhood, sorry, I stole that joke. My neighborhood was old. 
I was like I younger than drink. anybody else's great grandchild in those days in that neighborhood. And I walked in with these three bombshells wearing gold lame cat suits, cat ears, and me holding them with leashes. <laughs> I think, yeah, there was. Right, I, Enough. I, I, listen, listen. So I want to tell one on that makes second, me look like the, the idiot that I am. The now, second, though. the second bunch. Yes. Okay. When I showed up, when we came home, yes. Two girls. Yes. To apartment, and there was three there already. Right. So I have one in my room. You have four. Yeah. You have four. Uh -huh. But I did beat you, because you had an eight cheek stack. Yes. Right. I actually did a ten cheek stack, which is considered a mega stack. I've uh, never had a ten cheek stack. No, I have only once in my life. I Thank told you. you, the man's a rock star. That, okay. <laughs> man's a rock star. But I never had that situation. Do we have time for one more? Because I want yes, to tell a story that makes Go me ahead. look like a jackass. Let it that roll. I am. All okay. right, jackass. <laughs> this guy, one of, one of the club owners, was a guy named Tiny. He was he managed a couple of clubs we played. Then he owned a couple of clubs we played. El Greco's. El Greco's was the most famous of the ones he owned. He was one of the managers of Fountain Casino before that, which was a very famous, very large club down on the Jersey Shore. But he opened a place in Trenton right before we got our record, right before our big breakthrough. And we were still trying to figure out how to get further south. So tw Trenton was like 20 miles past we had ever gone before. So it was a big deal. And. And in those days, we had already figured out the, the Bad Boy stage set, which was those pink chain link fences yeah. with the black and spray painted pink. And what people don't realize is that was not, those were not stage props. Those were, we'd steal chain link we and had poles real chain and weld them. Fences and poles. They were real. Yeah. So, um, and Frankie, our little production manager, who's Frank, 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 Frank. Frankie was instructed, one day he set him up, he set up the stage, and the, the, the fences were sort of hanging over the sides of the stage because it was really little. So we decided to leave them off and I gave him an earful and I said to him, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not ever have me walk in for a sound check and not have those fences there, right? So for a year, everything was fine. And then one day we walk into Tony's new, uh, t uh, Tiny's, Tiny's new room and I get there for a sound check and there's, and there's fencing on house right, house left, there's no fence. And Frank, Where's the fence? He says, what's right over there? So why is it up? He says, well, because the top, you see that, you see the little, you see the header up there? I said, what, you mean that piece of wood? He said, yeah, well, what about it? He said, it's in the way. I said, so make it not be in the way. He said, what do you mean? I said, Frank, give me a saw and a ladder. Brings me a saw and a ladder, put the ladder down, climb up the ladder, give me the saw, <laughs> cut a notch, give me the fence, slam it in like that, jam it in really good. Was that so hard, Frank? Uh, yeah, but Joe, that's, a, and, the, and then I hear Tiny's voice, Tiny, aptly named, he's 6'14", six, six you know, 320 pounds, he was booming, what the, did you do to my club? So what are you talking about? He says, you cut the header. I said, you mean that little piece of wood that was sticking up there? Says, that little piece of wood? That little piece of wood was holding the roof of the building up. <laughs> you idiot. This is true. This is true. I, I said, oh, I'm, my bad. Um, we, left, we left the piece of fence in, the, in when right, we left that night, up. holding the building. They had to get engineering firms in. and they, Oh, it was a whole big McGill. And that's how I learned what a header was. <laughs> Live and learn. Yeah. Who knew? Joe, the stories could go, go on. They could, actually. And, oh, there's so much. So we much haven't much even scratched the surface. We, yeah, there really is. We'll bring you back on for another I'd love one, to. Right? We've already been on for an hour and a half already, not including yeah. the little. I, I'm sorry, two, over two hours, right? Yeah. And not including the little interlude we had. Uh, yeah, the, oh, the uh, breakdown. Uh, with, with the funniest Steven story ever told, I might add, which yeah. I'm not telling yeah. again. <laughs> That'll teach you to blame him. <laughs> <laughs> all right, listen. Uh, the show is. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I am Mark Mendoza, but I'll say it again. The show is 22 Now. The network is Area 22 Productions. Always look us up. Check everything out. We spent a great amount of time with someone who's very dear and very close to me, uh, Joe Gerber, who has uh, got a mega history with Twisted Sister and, and quite a few other bands. Uh, yeah. Uh, without a doubt. That too. And uh, we're just running out of time tonight. So uh, we will let you know when we have Joe on again, and uh, we'll continue some of the crazy stories because I've got a couple more pages of stuff that we that we we really need we to really go over touch and, any of and that, tell funny we? stories about. But uh, the girls in the lingerie definitely was I a top of the list. I can't believe you brought that up, man. That he said to me he had a surprise for me. I, 
For the life of me, I did not think he was going there. Yeah, for the life of the list. It was bad enough you brought Harold in the, and, and the uh, comfortable motorcycling up. Right, right. How, Howie. You were, you not were Harold, kidding. but Howie. Howard, How, Howie. Howie. Howie, Howie, Howie like Thomas, yes. Anyway, uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. We had a great time. I hope everybody enjoyed all the stories. And uh, I know there's a lot of SMFs out there, TS fans, that uh, like to hear some of this stuff. And we'll do it again real soon. Have a great night. Enjoy the rest of the week. See you next week. Thank you for having me.